With a meeting, please come to order. So far, we have 600 people who have registered for tonight's meeting. We're expecting well over 1,000. Uh, we have accommodations in this auditorium. In the cafeteria, we have another 500 seats, and we have additional seats in the gymnasium. We would particularly like to be able to fit as many people as possible into this auditorium and in the cafeteria because of the proximity to the stage here if persons wish to speak. So once again, please move away from the aisles towards the empty seats so that we can make room for additional persons to be seated. While you're doing that, I will now start the meeting. As I mentioned, we already have a quorum of more than 175 present. With your permission, we will waive the reading of the constable's return of the warrant. I'd like to welcome you to Dover's 2017 annual town meeting. While the remainder of you are getting to your seats, a few preliminaries. The fire chief reminds us that there is no smoking in the building and no sitting in the aisles or on the stairs. Please place your cell phone into airphone mode or turn it off. A few years ago, we had problems with our PA system because of interactions with cell phones. Throughout the auditorium tonight, and as you enter the building, you saw 20 or so residents with name tags and orange bibs on. These individuals have been designated by the town clerk to help ensure the smooth running of tonight's meeting. As the evening progresses, please follow their instructions and give them your attention. In addition, the following Dover Boy Scouts from Troop One are serving as pages. Oliver Freed, Finn Satelny, Bobby Giassi, Jamie Hackney, James Gibson, and James Gibbons, and Varen Gianti. These pages will be responsible for bringing a microphone to persons who are unable to queue up in the front behind the microphones that are in the front of the aisle. Non-voters and non-residents are welcome to attend our town meeting, but they should be seated in the areas designated to my left or in the cafeteria. Our guests tonight includes our, include our state representative, Denise Garlick. Thank you, Representative Garlick, for your service to Dover. Some introductions. I am James Rapetti, the moderator for the town of Dover. In that, in that role, I will oversee tonight's proceedings. On your left, my right, we have the Board of Selectmen, Robin Hunter Chair, Candace McCann, and John Jeffries. We have our town administrator, David Ramsey, town council, Nina Pickering Cook, assistant moderator, Paul White, and our town clerk, Felicia Hoffman. On your right, my left, we have the Warren Committee, Kate Canney Chair, James Stewart, John Cohn, Fred Hammerly, Kathy Gilbody, Brooks Gurnard, Carol Cherico, Rodney Peterson, and Erica Alders. That is an applause well-deserved. They have all worked extraordinarily hard, as have our town employees. So we greatly appreciate the thanks for their hard work. Assistant Moderator David Havlin is in the cafeteria, and Assistant Moderator Peter Smith is in the gymnasium, should we need to use the gymnasium tonight. They will be con conducting the proceedings in those rooms. A few words on procedure and tradition. A handout circulated this evening summarizes the basic rules for town meeting, but let me emphasize a few key points. The guide that we use to conduct our town meeting is not Robert's rules, but rather it's a volume called Town Meeting Time, compiled and updated by a committee of the Massachusetts Moderators Association. This volume is our tradition, this volume and our traditions set forth numerous thou shalts and thou shalt nots but much is left to local custom and to my discretion. Before each article, I will state the subject matter of the article and then recognize a person to make a motion on the article. The full text of each of these articles is printed in the blue book, and in most cases, the Warren Committee has included a summary of their position on the article in the blue book. If you did not bring your blue book with you tonight, please raise your hand and a page will bring you one now. 
Okay, while the scouts are distributing those, let me continue with the introductory remarks. If you wish to discuss a motion, you must be recognized by the moderator before speaking. You will note that there are two microphones in the front of the auditorium at the front of the aisles here in front of the stage. If you wish to comment on a motion, please proceed to one of the microphones and wait in line until you're called upon to speak. I will alternate between the two microphones. We have a, a, a couple of people right here in the middle also. In addition, I appreciate that some of you may not be able to stand in line. If you are unable to stand in line, please raise your hand if you wish to address town meeting on a particular motion. I will alternate between those standing in line in the front of the auditorium behind each of these microphones and those who remain seated in proportion to the relative numbers of each so that everybody will hopefully have an opportunity to speak. After you are recognized, please identify yourself as well as your street address and speak directly into the microphone. The power switch will already be on. It is important to remember that brevity is the soul of wit. I would like to remind all our speakers tonight that the longer and more complex your presentation, the greater the chance that you will confuse rather than persuade. We have a lot to cover tonight, so I am going to limit motion presenters to 10 minutes and comments from the floor to two minutes. Please try to limit your remarks to new facts or new perspectives. Repeating what has already been said is unlikely to help your case and may indeed hurt if people are anxious to vote on the question. Limiting comments from the floor to two minutes will provide the maximum opportunity for all who wish to speak to be heard. This is a fragile thing, our tradition of town meeting. Too many rules and it will become a game only lawyers can play, too loose and it will become anarchy. A further word about our conduct. Disagreement is the essence of democracy. It would be a very boring town meeting if we agreed about everything but it's imperative that we disagree without being disagreeable. Let us honor the memory of all those who sacrificed to give us this great gift of democracy by conducting ourselves in a professional and collegial manner. Emotional outbursts or accusations directed toward individuals or groups have no place in dishonor the memory of those who sacrificed to provide us this great gift of democracy. Before we proceed to the articles of the warrant, would you please join me in expressing our thanks to the scores of elected and appointed volunteers who compromise our town government, as well as the able employees who ensure the smooth running of the town. Tonight, I would also like to especially remember Dover citizens who contributed to Dover's governance and have passed away since the last annual meeting. Judith Wright Dorgan, Satimio Ernest Latazzi, John J. McDonald, Shirley McGill, Beverly Ryburn, and Nancy Higgins Story. We mourn the passing of these neighbors and we are grateful for the difference they made in the life of our town. As I mentioned, democracy is a wonderful prize that has been preserved through the sacrifice and efforts of millions of our citizens. Let us take a moment to silently recognize those who are putting themselves in harm's way at this very moment in service of our country. A moment of silence, please. Thank you and may God bless America. Before we begin, I would like to spend a moment now talking about the voting process. You may recall that last year we had 950 citizens attend town meeting, and every time we had to take a standing vote count, it took about 30 minutes to count all the votes. We expect that there will be at least three standing votes tonight, or the equivalent of three standing votes. In order to save us from devoting one hour and a half to counting votes, Felicia Hoffman, our town clerk, has worked very hard with turning technology to utilize response cards that you were issued as you entered the high school. Please note that you must be seated in the room that you were instruct, instructed to proceed to in order for your response card to work. If you have a red dot on your response card, you should be seated in the auditorium. If you have a yellow dot, you should be in the cafeteria. 
And if you have a blue dot, you should be in the gymnasium. When we have a vote, can you have a new slide, please? When we have a vote, you'll be pressing the buttons one or two that's on your response card. Re pressing one will be a yes vote. Pressing two will be a no vote. You will see your choice appear on the screen, and you'll also see a green light light up after you have pressed the button for your vote. You will have 20 seconds to enter your vote or to change your mind. The last item that you enter will be the one that's counted. So let's have a practice session. The question, please. Tonight is, a, tonight is a great night for our town meeting. If you agree, please vote yes, pressing one. If you disagree, please vote no by pressing two. And after you press, you should see a green light blinking on your card. If you do not see a green light blinking on your card, please raise your hand after you enter your vote. Okay, we have some uh, hands over in a group over here. Right over here, Jessica. Please keep your hand raised if you're having trouble and you're not seeing the green light. Is everybody all set now? If you're still having a problem, please raise your hand. There's a person over here. Let me do this. Okay. Okay. Okay, fine. Okay. So Jessica is going to reopen voting. And uh, while she's doing that, Jessica, do you want people to vote one and Okay, go ahead and vote. Press one for yes, no for two. If you do not see a green light flashing in the upper right-hand corner, then that means that your card's not working. Please raise your hand. You should, see, should be seeing that light immediately after you vote. The green light goes away after you press. It just flashes once or twice and then goes away. Anybody else? We ready to go? All right, very good. We, ju we just saved an hour and a half. Thank you. Before we begin tonight's pre proceedings, it is customary to recognize the chairman of the Warren Committee for a few remarks. Mrs. Canney. Good evening. I would like to thank the members of the Warren Committee, my colleagues, for their thoughtful and diligent efforts this year and a continued sense of humor. They put in many long hours reviewing department and committee budgets and Warren articles in preparation for tonight's meeting. I'm grateful for everything they've done to support me. I would also like to thank the representatives of the various town departments and committees who worked with us as a committee to develop the proposed operating budget for fiscal year 2018. We have a very long night ahead of us, and I personally would love to see this the only one night, so I'm going to end my remarks there, and James Stewart's going to present Article 4.
Good evening. Thank you for coming. On behalf of the Warren Committee, I'm going to give you an overview of this year's operating budget. The details are all in the blue book, which you should have received. And um, this uh, summary is uh, a little bit of a um, sort of shorter version than it's been in previous years, just due to the expected length of tonight's meeting. So tonight, next slide. Tonight, what we're going to talk about next is the operating budget, which is Article 4. And that includes salaries and expenses, not capital or special items. We're also going to talk about overall revenues and expenditures, which is the entire budget, which includes operating capital and special items. And then the third thing we're going to talk about is free cash, which is, for some of you who um, may not be familiar with them, it's the town's free reserves, which have built up over time. And annually, we've been applying them to the annual budget. Next slide. The fiscal year 18 budget summary next. The total expenditures for fiscal year 18 are 38,990,000 versus 36,282,000 for fiscal year 17. And that's an increase of 2.7 million or 7.5%. Next. The Article 4 operating budget uh, we're proposing for 18 is 36.9 million versus 34. Uh, 35.0 million, uh, 0.0, um, which was an increase of um, 1.9 million um, or 5.4 percent. Next slide. Total revenues, that is the town's tax revenues and other um, other uh, forms of revenue, are 37.4 million versus 36.1 million in fiscal year 17, and that's an increase of 1.3 million or three and a half percent. And the use of free cash, which is what we use to cover the, the gap between total revenues and expenditures, um, and this is the minimum amount that we use to balance the budget, is 1.6 million versus 813,000 last year, which is an increase of 800 thousand or about 98 percent. Um, we are going to have a slight change in the way in what we do for free cash and I'll get to that a little bit later on or what we're going to propose to do for free cash and I'll get that later on. The major increases for fiscal year 18 in article 4 are next the schools which is uh, which are up by 923,000 or 4.3 percent next and of that the Dover Regional Schools Operating Assessment is up by uh, 625,000, and Dover School Operating is up by 442,000, um, 5.9 and 4.5% respectively. Next. Insurance and pensions. Group health insurance in the budget is up by 288,000 or 12.6%. Workers' compensation is up a relatively nominal 18,000 or 23%. Next, and the, um, the the budget item for protection of persons and property is up by 135,000 or 4.4, and that's composed of 35,000 for police, 45 for uh, fire, and 28 for ambulance, up by those percentages you see. Um, Norfolk County retirement, which you can't see because it's behind the podium, is up by 81,000 or 7.2 percent. Next slide. The decreases in the Article 4 budget were largely um, the uh, Dover Regional School Debt Assessment, which was down by 133,000 or 18.6%. Next. And the above increases, which I've described, account for about 1.3 million increase of the overall 1.9 million increase in the Article 4 budget, or about 70%. The other items are much smaller. And it's 48% of the increase in the um, total expenditures. Next slide. Um, as far as capital items and special articles, increases Article 5 and special articles. Article 5 is up by 56,000, um, which is actually 15.8%. Uh, special articles was up by 47,000, 22%, and special articles other 
was up by 675,000. That's primarily due to the fact that uh, the Chickering air conditioning um, cost is in there. Um, these items represent a $776,000 increase of the total 2.7 million increase in total expenditures or about 29%. Next slide. This slide gives a sense of what the budget components are. Um, the bulk of our budget of $39 million is operating budget. That's about 88 or 89% debt service, special articles, capital items, and um, some other smaller items. So you can see that most of what we spend is in article four. Next. The spending within Article 4 by category, Dover schools operating is 28.1%, uh, regional schools is about 30.5%, um, general government is about 58 protective services 86 and insurance and pensions is 115 so that gives a sense of what we're spending in Article 4. Next. From the... Uh, perspective of es estimated revenues, the bulk of our revenues do come from our property tax levy. It's 81%. Um, we get about 5.6 from local receipts. Um, there's state aid. There's new growth from um, uh, that also presents about 1% or so. And then this year, the minimum use of free cash is about 4.2%. So this gives you a sense of where we get our revenues from. Next. This is our traditional slide where we show what our revenue sources are and expenditures. And um, it shows where we're um, getting our revenues from and where we're making our expenditures. Next. Um, when we take our revenues and our expenditures, um, we uh, have a gap. And for that, we've traditionally been using free cash, which is our reserves built up over time. And this year, just based on, just to close the gap, um, it's a $1.6 million um, uh, difference in use of free cash. However, as I mentioned, um, we are actually um, uh, recommending something different this time. Um, in previous years, or as in previous years, we consider the recent level of free cash um, of free cash that we have, the town's finances and predicted financial needs, uses and expenses, expectations over the year, and medium and long term um, as well to make a recommendation for free cash. This year, the Warrant Committee is considering alternatives, which would include the use of an additional amount of free cash to pay for approved expenses and or to lower the tax rate. We will have uh, this recommendation um, I'll get to as we, as we move along. Next slide. This slide shows the use of free cash or the budget gap over time, and it, it, it follows from 20, 2006 on to 2018, and it's the percentage of, um, of, uh, of the budget gap over the total expenses. And we typically have been in this five to six percent range, and in the past two years, we've been sort of in the lower end of the range. Next slide. Um, as I said, the Warrant Committee reviewed and analyzed the level of free cash as we do every year. Next. Um, we've experienced a significant increase in free cash in recent years due to conservative budget practices, prudent management of expenses, favorable new growth, uh, and unanticipated uh, large turnbacks. For instance, um, from the regional schools, last year we received a turnback um, of in excess of $400,000, which was um, uh, is likely non-recurring, but uh, was something that was quite rare um, as well. Next slide. Uh, the current level of uh, free cash is at a level that's, as we see it, has surpassed prudent necessity. Um, next. The Massachusetts Department of Revenue recommends a minimum of five to seven percent of annual expenses in total reserves. That is free cash, stabilization funds, and overlay revenues, which are sort of a technical thing. Um, these amounts would be 2.9 uh, to 2.7 million for Dover. Uh, next, 
The Warrant Committee believes free cash target of 10 to 15 percent would be more appropriate. That would be about 3.9 to 5.9 million. Um, and just to finish on that thought, the high level of free cash may reflect ex post excess taxation for realized, the realized costs of providing these services approved at town meeting. Although there may have been unexpected revenues from state aid grants and uh, proceeds from lawsuits. Um, the Warrant Committee voted unanimously to recommend that we use an additional $1.3 million of free cash in Article 29 tonight to further reduce the property tax rate. Next. That will leave $5.2 million of uncommitted free cash, which is 13.4% of the forecasted fiscal year 18 total expenses, including the stabilization fund. The reserves would be 6.1 million in total, which is about 15.7% of expenses. Next. Um, this recommendation does not rely upon an assumption that free cash will continue to grow at a significant pace above what is required to replenish the account, but we feel it's a prudent um, thing to do at this point. Next. This slide just updates the previous slide, which shows the revenues and expenditures. Instead of using 1.613 million of free cash, the recommendation is 2.913, which reflects the 1.3 million additional amount, and it show, this shows how it balances. Next slide. Um, based on this anal the analysis, the Warren Committee believes one, the use of 1.3 million additional free cash to achieve the target range is prudent and it will not limit our flexibility. Um, we believe it's judicious to be at the upper end of the 10 to 15 percent range, not at the lower end of that range at this point. Next slide. Um, what does this mean for the tax levy? The over, what, it, what it means is that it's likely that the overall tax levy for the town from this additional free cash will actually be lower than it would have been for fiscal year 18. However, you should know that individual property taxes may be lower, higher, or the same because those depend on the relative assessments by the assessor. So this is not a um, decision that affects each individual. It affects the overall town, which then filters through how, however it does. Next slide. Yeah. And that's the summary. Thank you. Thank you, James, and thank you to the Warren Committee. At this time, it is customary to recognize the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Ms. Hunter. In the spirit of keeping things short, I'm going to try to do the same as Kate Caney. Uh, I wanted to say that town meeting, at this town meeting, we once again will be deliberating on issues that are dividing our town. As a community, town meeting is the place for all of us to debate. But at the end of town meeting, once the majority has voted, it is really time for us to close the rift that has opened and rebuild our community. After all, we are all neighbors and friends who are passionate about Dover, which is our home. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all the volunteers that serve on committees. Town meeting is one night, but it takes an entire year to prepare for town meeting. I would especially like to thank Felicia Hoffman, who's sitting next to me, who has really worked tirelessly to try and make this town meeting as efficient as any that we have had. So thank you, Felicia. Lastly, I would like to say farewell and thank you to our interim superintendent, Bill McCaldiff. Bill, we truly appreciate all of your efforts and your commitment to this town, and I, for one, am really appreciative of being a, having been a, able to work with you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ms. Hunter. I now would like to call upon Mrs. Kenny, Chair of the Warren Committee, to make a motion customary to the conduct of the town meeting. Mr. Moderator, I move that the following rule be adopted for the conduct of this meeting. Any amendment to a main motion that would increase an appropriation must contain a provision for the source of the funds for the increase, such that the total amount to be raised and appropriated at the town meeting will not be increased. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Cohn has seconded the motion made by Mrs. Canney. Is there any discussion now? Again, tonight, if you would like to discuss one of the motions, please come to the front to the microphone. We're doing that to save time from having the scouts bring microphones to people in the audience. If somebody has difficulty standing in line, please raise your hand and I'll, bring, I'll ask a scout to bring you a microphone. Is there any discussion? Any discussion in the gymnasium? <coughs> Okay, no discussion in the gymnasium. This is a majority vote. Uh, again, once I call the vote, you will have 20 seconds to press one for yes, you're in favor of the motion, or two for no, you are not in favor of the motion. If you change your mind, you will have 20 min minutes, 20 seconds to re-enter your vote. <laughs> The small green light in the upper right will indicate that your vote has been received and it will only be on for a few seconds. I would now like to call the vote. Please press one for yes. Please press two for no. Sorry, Jessica. That was my fault. I one too many. Okay. Should we start again? Okay. Let's start again. So. If you want to approve the motion, please press one for yes, two for no. You may start to enter your vote now. Okay, the vote carries 624 to 21, a few contrarians among us tonight. Okay, Article 1 pertains to uh, formal, uh, to annual reports submitted by the, and this article is submitted by the selectmen. Mrs. Canney. Mr. Moderator, I move that the reading of the various reports by the town clerk be waived and the reports be accepted and placed on file. Thank you, Mrs. Canney. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. This motion is uh, to waive the reading of the town reports. Again, when I call the vote, please press one if you are in favor of this motion. Please press two if you are opposed. You will have 20 seconds to vote. Please begin the vote now. Is there a problem, Jessica? Okay. Okay. I've been told that if you can see the green at the top, you can start uh, voting. Now, uh, Jessica, will there a time also be displayed on the screen still? Okay. So. Okay. Okay, 609 in favor, 16 opposed, the motion carries. Did everybody cards work? Does somebody have a problem? We have a hand right here in the middle aisle. If I could have a technician help here. Uh, might leave the microphone. We don't need the microphone. We need a technician to help a person who's having difficulty with the card. He's obtaining a replacement card for you, ma'am. Uh, 
All set? Okay. Okay, we now move to Article 2, which pertains to the construction, reconstruction, and other improvement of town roads. Ms. Alders. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town authorize the Board of Selectmen to enter into contracts, apply for, accept, expend, and borrow in anticipation of any funds allotted by the Commonwealth for the construction, reconstruction, and other improvements of town roads and related infrastructure. Thank you, Ms. Alders. Do I hear a second? I second that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Peterson. Motion has been made and seconded uh, for the article, our motion pertaining to the construction, reconstruction, and other improvement of town roads. When I tell you that voting is open, please press one for yes, please press no for two, and again, you will have 20 seconds. Vote now. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries 634 to 17. Article 3, town salaries for elected officials. Ms. Cherico. Mr. Moderator, I move that the salaries recommended for elected officials of the town, as shown in the right-hand column of the Warrant Committee report, be called over by the moderator, and that if no objection is raised to any of them, they be approved as read. Thank you, Ms. Cherico. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Alders. Motion has been made and moved, uh, has been moved and seconded to, that I read the salaries on page 29 of the blue book for article three. If this motion passes, I will read the salaries and put on hold those items objected to. We will then consider individually those items for which an objection has been voiced. All items that have not been objected to will be deemed to have been approved. Any questions on this motion? Again, this motion directs me to read the salaries. Any salaries not objected to are deemed to have been approved. If you would like to object to a salary, as I read it, simply yell hold. And then we'll come back to that particular salary item and have a separate motion with respect to that item. Okay, I will now ask you to vote yes if you are in favor of this motion or no if you are opposed, beginning now. One is yes, two is no. <laughs> Motion carries 583 to 41. I will now read the salaries that are on page 29 of the Blue Book. Board of Selectmen, Chairman, 200, Clerk, 150, other member, 100. Assessors, Chairman, 400, other members each, 350. Town Clerk, 57,368. Planning Board, Chairman, 100, other members, 50. Constables, three, each $150. Board of Health, Chairman, 150. Other members, 100. I did not hear any holds in the auditorium. Are there any holds in the cafeteria? No. Okay, no holds. Motion carries. There are no objections to it, so we move on to the next article. Article four, salaries for town employees and expenditures by departments. Mr. Cohn. Mr. Moderator, I move that the salaries and expenses recommended by the departments, officers, boards, and committees of the town, as shown in the FY 2018 requested column in the Warrant Committee report, be called over by the moderator. And if no objection is made, that the town appropriate such sums and raise such amounts from the tax levy and from other general revenues of the town except that $10,400 of the amount appropriated pursuant to line item 710 therein for maturing debt principal shall be transferred from the Title V receipt reserved for appropriation account. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Canney. 
Motion has been made and seconded. This is just like the last article. If you approve this motion, I will read the budget items beginning on page 30 of the Blue Book for Article 4. If you have a question, simply say hold as I read a particular line item, and we will go back to it at the end. Items for which no hold is voiced will be deemed to have been approved. This is a majority vote. Is there any discussion on this motion? Any discussion in the cafeteria? No. Okay. So again, if you approve of this motion, press one for yes, press two for no, beginning now. Motion carries 592 to 40. Thank you. Okay, I will now read the items beginning on page 30 of the Blue Book. If anybody wants, has a question with respect to our item, wishes discussion, please yell hold. I'm going to go very quickly. I'll ask again at the end, after I've read the list, if there were any holds for a particular item. Okay, number 301, moderator, zero. Glad we got that out of the way. <laughs> One. 131, Warrant Committee, $7,680. 122, Selectman, total, $375,221. 192, Townhouse Expenses, $68,856. 191, Whiting Road, $4,734. 193, Carroll Community Center, $105,384. 199, Building Maintenance, total, Three hundred eighteen thousand five hundred ninety-six dollars. One twenty-nine copy postage thirty thousand six hundred. One fifty-one law two hundred thousand. One thirty-five. I'm now on page thirty-one. One thirty-five town accountant total two hundred nineteen thousand four hundred twenty-three. One forty-one assessor total one hundred seventy-three thousand twenty-two. One forty-five treasurer collector total two hundred twenty-one thousand two eighty-three. 155 data processing total 141,333. 161 town clerk total 68,353 over the page 32. 162 election registration total 48,231. 175 planning board total 65,034. 411 engineering total 102,218. Police 200 number 201. Two million three thousand forty dollars for the total amount. Two ninety nine protective agency building on page thirty three, total ninety six thousand one hundred seventy five. Two ninety two animal control total twenty nine thousand five hundred eighty two. Two hundred twenty fire five hundred thirty thousand six hundred five. Two thirty one ambulance total two hundred five thousand nine hundred sixty one. 241 billion inspector, total 114,265. Page 34, 291 emergency management, total 1,923. Conservation Commission of one, number 171, total 79,996. Number 176, Board of Appeals, total 4,057. Number 294, care of trees, total 112,074. Number 295, Tree Committee, 2,500. Page 35, Health and Sanitation, number 433, Garbage Disposal, 19,364. 439, Solid Waste, total 403,794. 450, Town Water, total 28,648. Number 519, Board of Health, total 87,148. Highway and Bridges, number 422. Maintenance, total 753,265. Snow and Ice, number 423, on page 36. Total 420,000. 424, Lighting, 12,489. Number 425, Town Garage, 82,415. Number 428, Tarvia and Patching, 275,000. Number 194, for other public agencies, energy coordinator, zero. 
491 cemetery, 112,478 total. Five, number 541, Council of Aging, 144,505. Number 610 on page 37, library, total 621,866. Number 650, parks and recreation, total 429,655. Unclassified services, number 152, personnel committee, zero. 178, Dover Housing Partnership, zero. Number 195, town report, $9,150. Number 543, veterans, total $2,000. 691, historic commission, 1,250. 692, Memorial Day, 3,000, over the page 38. Under insurance, number 912, workman's co workers' compensation, 95,877. Nine four, number 914, group insurance, $2,572,170. Number 916, Medicare FICA, $177,981. Number 950, other insurance, $180,780. Did I hear a hold? No? Okay. Um, pensions, 911, Norfolk County Retirement, $1,210,458. Schools, 600, Dover School Operating. $10,357,943. Number 601, Dover Shearer Regional Operating Assessment and Debt Assessment Total, $11,816,976. Number 602, Minuteman Vocational, 63,533. Number 604, Norfolk County Agricultural High School, 6,000. On to debt, number 710, and we're on page 39. 710, maturing debt principal, 1,392,900. Number 751, maturing debt interest, 259,375. Number 759, bake charges, $4,000. I did not hear any holds in the auditorium. Were there any holds in the cafeteria? There were no hoes, therefore this article passes. On to the next article. Okay, Article 5, the capital budget. Mrs. Gurnan. Mr. Moderator, I move that the following sums recommended for the various capital purposes be called over by the moderator, and if no objection is made that the town raise and appropriate such sums unless another funding source is noted, and that any sums realized from the trade-in or auction of old equipment shall be used to reduce the cost of the acquisition of new equipment or to purchase related accessories. Thank you, Ms. Gurnard. Do I hear a second? I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Hamley. So a motion has been made and seconded that, like the other articles, I call over the capital budget, which, by the way, begins on page 40 of your blue book. If there are no objections or holds with respect to any of the items that I call, then the budget will be deemed approved. If somebody objects or asks for a hold, that particular item will not be approved and we'll have a separate consideration and discussion of that item. Is there any discussion with respect to this motion? Any discussion in the gymnasium? No. Okay, very good. As in the other uh, votes, if you Approve of this motion, please press one for yes when I give you the sign, or please press two for no. We may begin now, please vote. Okay, the motion carries 626 to 24. Thank you very much. We are now going to skip ahead to some of the other articles that are likely to be more time consuming. I'm sorry? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I wanted to jump ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So let me th read through the items as beginning on page 40 of the, uh, of the blue book. 
couple of pages of you in here. We're using the white book. Yeah. Page 15. Okay. Okay, cemetery commission, tractor, 22,000. Fire and ambulance, RTV off-road rescue vehicle, 25,000. Okay, I have a hold on number two, the RTV off-road rescue vehicle. Three, police department, patrol vehicle, 36,500. Upgrade to department servers, 14,000. Replace defibrillators, 19,300. Four, school committee. Cafeteria audio visual system, zero. Cafeteria floors, 20,500. Technology hardware, 13,000. Five, board of selectmen. Energy audit lighting upgrade, 95,322. B, protective agencies building exterior painting, 18,000. C, fire station overhead door open is 35,000. D, Carroll Community Center, AC for blue room, 20,000. E, townhouse replace wheelchair lift, 50,000. F, Carroll Community Center, expansion and paving, 25,000. Whiting Road, painting of exterior, 15,000. I heard a hold with respect to 2A, the RTV off-road vehicle. Were there any other holes in the, in the auditorium? No. All right, in the cafeteria, no. There's a hand over here, there was a hold? No, no hold, yes. For, for which vehicle, the, the RTV? Yeah. Okay, before you ask the question, sir, let me ask for a motion with respect to this item that's held, and then we'll ask you to uh, please come down to the microphone and voice your question. Okay, so could I have a motion with respect to number two, fire and ambulance, RTV off-road vehicle. Uh, Mrs. Gurner. Yes, Mr. Moderator, I move that 25,000 be raised and appropriated for item number two, fire and ambulance A RTV off-road rescue vehicle and that any sums realized from the trade-in or auction of old equipment be used to reduce the cost of acquisition of new equipment or to purchase related accessories. Thank you, Mrs. Gurner. Second? I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Hanley. Sir, could you state your name and address, please? Uh, my name is Steve Chicola. I live in Paris. Okay, and your question? What is the lifespan of this vehicle? Okay. What is the lifespan? Of the new vehicle, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, with anybody from? I'm sorry? Okay, Mr. Boy, sir, why don't you come down, Bob, just to... No, I, I heard him. He's fine. No, but everybody else may not have, and it needs to be... It was stated 10 years for those people who want to clarify it. It's okay. Okay, thank you. That will suffice. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any... <laughs> Are there any other questions? Any questions in the cafeteria? Okay. So we have a motion with respect to the uh, vehicle, the, uh, the RTV off-road vehicle. Motion has been made and second is no further discussion. If you are in favor of the motion to approve purchase of this vehicle, you will press one on your reply card. If you're opposed, please press two, beginning now. Okay, the motion carries 568 to 77, thank you. Now, as I was saying before, in order to make a determination whether we'll be able to complete all of our work tonight, we're now going to move to the items that are more likely to be time consuming, and then we'll make a judgment at 10 o'clock whether we should adjourn at about that point or continue to try to get through all of our business tonight. Just a reminder with respect to some of these items, 
is that? 300 seats open. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question about whether we need to move people into the gym, um, but we can continue with our discussion. Uh, just a reminder that as you, you look at the uh, handout on process, you'll note on the back page of the handout on process that there's something called a motion for reconsideration. And any article that's voted on can be reconsidered by a vote of the town meeting. So if you're here for your favorite article, you should not leave until we have dissolved the town meeting because the item that you voted on can come up for reconsideration and has quite frequently in the past. So just a word to the wise that you should stay here um, after, even after your particular item has been approved or not approved as the case may be. We're now going to jump ahead to Article 12 to deal with the Chickering air conditioning. Mr. Cohn. Mr. Moderator. I move that the town appropriate the sum of $675,000 by transfer from free cash to be expended by the Dover School Committee for the purpose of paying costs of adding air conditioning to the Chickering School, including the payment of all costs inc incidental and related thereto. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Do I hear a second? I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Hamley. I would like to have discussion first, Mr. Hill. Yes. Bonnie, could you come down to the microphone, please? Do we have to have a, an, a motion to take articles out of order? No, we do not. Since when? Uh, <laughs> since um, we asked the question. <laughs> we do not. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Again, this is, Bonnie, the reason we're doing this is to try to make a judgment so that at 10 o'clock, uh, that we can determine whether we're going to need to return for a second evening or whether we can race through the remaining articles. Um, I would now like to call upon Mr. Hill from the school chair of the school committee to discuss Article 12. And Article 12, by the way, is on page 49 of the Blue Book. Thanks, Jim. That was a bit loud. Um, for those of you who don't uh, know me, my name is Adrian Hill. Uh, I am chair of the Dover School Committee, 24 Sadler Ridge Road. I have two children and lived in Dover since 2001. This is the fifth time that I've been fortunate enough to do this presentation in public. Uh, and I just want to take a couple of seconds to thank uh, the people who have listened, people who have uh, given questions, people who have helped the team, and also the people who have taken my calls and sat with me to learn about the, the rationale for this article. Um, it's, uh, it's very much appreciated and the conversations I've had have made me feel that Dover is a very special place, so thank you. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about why we're actually here and why, why I'm talking about this. This is uh, the culmination of, of nine years' work uh, from very many groups of parents, administrators, uh, volunteers and school committee members. I may be the one standing up here, but I really just feel like I'm the person holding the microphone after so many years of uh, efforts to investigate high heat at Chickering and the issues for the children and, and staff in the classrooms. Uh, so please, I want to stress this is the culmination of many years of investigations. It is not a hasty or rushed proposal. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background and history for the building, what research has been done on heat and humidity in the classrooms, the data that's been gathered, what work has been done, the various options we considered, and the solution that was selected. Next slide, please. Just a bit of background briefly. The school was built in 2001. Um, at the time, no mechanical cooling or air conditioning was installed in classrooms, despite the fact that the actual building structure and shell was initially designed for air conditioning. When the building was actually built and finished, the classrooms did not have air conditioning. Uh, rooftop AC does exist, however, for certain rooms, computer labs, library, administration, uh, and the music classrooms. Going back to 2003, uh, we found evidence of complaints from students, 
parents and teachers of excessive heat, uh, especially in the shoulder seasons. And this has worsened as the years has gone on with uh, students reporting to the nurse vomiting through heat stroke, uh, not being an uncommon occurrence. Next slide, please. Again, a bit of context on the building. Uh, there is zero cooling capacity in the building overall. Uh, overall. There is just an air exchange system. The air exchange ducts that exist there cannot support classroom AC. We've had that confirmed by architects. They are insufficient in size. And the windows in the classrooms, unfortunately, they don't open sufficiently for any cross breeze, which is clearly unhelpful. Next slide, please. The problem, essentially, is at night, the building does not cool down. So in a typical house, it would get very hot in the summer. The, building would, the, the inside of your house would, would get warm if you didn't have air conditioning. And then at night, when it cools down to 59 degrees or so, you'd leave the windows open and the building would cool, cool down commensurately with the temperature. This doesn't happen at Chickering School Building. The positive pressure in the building only allows it to the temperature to drop about four or five degrees. And what this means is when you get a series of very hot days, you get an increasing step upwards in the, uh, the temperature in the buildings. The, at 7 a.m. in the morning, the temperature inside is 79 degrees, and then the building starts warming up. The other context, 15 years ago, school never started before Labor Day. And now, as we all know, parents uh, with children in, in, in elementary schools, this is very much the norm. Next slide, please. A lot of this is very obvious, but I just want to put it up there. Uh, why do we care about heat and humidity in classrooms? This town spends an awful lot of money on its schools, on the curriculum, on the bricks and mortar, on the people inside, on how we try and spend our money for the best learning environment for students. To get the best return on that investment, we need to have the best learning environment for the children, and uh, uh, currently that is unfortunately not the case at Chickering School. We have a duty of care for the kids, responsibility to the staff. The science uh, and very many research reports are very clear that heat and humidity is unhelpful to learning and it can be unhealthy for students as well. And we've done some surveys in the school communities clearly calling for a change right now. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this just what is the right temperature of a school uh, classroom? Uh, the, the research says that 68 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal, but over 77 is harmful, uh, and it's harmful to learning and harmful to speed of reading, comprehension. I just want to say, we're, we're, not trying to we're not trying to create the most perfect, idyllic, utopian classroom environment here. We're not trying to get to 68, we're trying to get below 78, and I'll show you the data to back that up. Thank you. Next slide. So, uh, temperature is recorded hourly in a chicken classroom for the shoulder seasons during school hours. We gathered 13,300 data points. We went through and eliminated the, uh, any data with glitches, for example, if the temperature didn't move for four hours, but we had just over 13,300 data points. Next slide, please. I'm going to show you some color-related color charts. Um, a cell represents an hourly temperature recording in a classroom on a particular day. Any cell that is white is below 77. Again, not 68, that ideal temperature, but just below 77. Yellow is 78 to 80, orange 81 to 84, and over 85 degrees is red. Next slide, please. So for example, these are three days, and some classroom numbers at the top, uh, and you see there's not a single temperature there below 74 degrees. Next slide, please. This is the first week of school, Again, not one, 68 degrees. I apologize for this, the uh, small font size of the numbers, but the color coding, I think, speaks pretty eloquently. Next slide, please. This is a week two of school. So of those 13,300 data points, 65% in the shoulder seasons were over 78 degrees. 65% in those shoulder seasons in the classroom were over 78 degrees. Next slide, please. This is zooming in for a week two of school. Again, you can see the red. And next slide, please. This is the data charted a different way. Uh, so there were 31 classrooms at Chickering. How many rooms 
of those 31 along the vertical axis were hotter than 78 degrees in the first five weeks. And you see some very, very tall blue lines there. Next slide, please. Humidity is the other dynamic to this for trying to create an environment for children to learn. Uh, what's the right relative humidity level? Again, you look at the research, ideally it should be between 30 and 50%. In excess of 50, and the research confirms as health concerns and uh, slower learning, slower reading comprehension. Next slide, please. So we, there are humidity sensors at Chickering. They're not in the classrooms, so you can possibly discount this data a little bit. They're near the air handlers. Um, thank you. In 2016, uh, we measured readings and 70% almost were over 50%, almost 40% were over 70%. Very unhealthy. Next slide, please. Again, you can see the red, red is over 70%, the yellow is over 50%. Next slide, please. We also surveyed our community. In my experience, when, when you get surveys, if people answer, they care. But if they answer and leave a comment, they care a lot. Um, and we had an overwhelming support, some very moving comments from parents and families and teachers. Next slide, please. This is just an example. Uh, this is parents. Which symptoms have your child experienced? 77% sluggishness. You can see the, the worrying numbers there. Next slide, please. What have we done? We've explored non-air conditioning solutions. We tried to do this um, in, in a, in a non-mechanical way. Trees, dark films on windows, larger fans, recommissioned the air, con air conditioning system, sorry, the air exchange system, and we ruled out portable or window units. The portable ones are too noisy. Window AC units can't be supported with these windows. Next slide, please. We sought engineering advice. We had five engineering teams come in since 2008. Next slide, please. Which type of solution is best for chickering? Uh, there are four choices that were considered. And I'll have the next slide to show you our view. Um, a variable refrigerant flow split system because of efficiency, less piping costs, relatively quiet operation, 15, 20 year life. And this was unanimously um, recommended by the engineers. It's also the type of system installed in Brookline, Medway, and uh, Newburyport school system. Next slide, please. That's what it looks like. Next slide. Process. Um, we've had a design study that's given us a firm cost estimate. And after this design study, the installation will be put out to public bid. The lowest responsible bid is chosen. Any money is not used is returned to the town. Next slide, please. Cost is 675,000. I would note that it's less than the 852 that was our proof for the Dover Sherburn Middle School air conditioning. And the last slide, please. We've worked for many years, people, um, many more people than just myself. The non-air conditioning solutions have not been effective and we respectfully ask for funds for our elementary age students and teachers to have classroom cooling in line with their Dover Sherburn Middle School and upper school peers. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Hill. If anybody has any questions, please proceed to the front microphone uh, to get in line, and let's check to see if there are any questions in the, from the cafeteria. Okay, there's no questions in the cafeteria and none in the auditorium, so let's move to the vote. Pressing one for yes will be in favor of installing the air conditioning. Pressing two for no will be in opposition to the air conditioning. Uh, wait, wait, I'll give you the sign. You can vote now, thank you. Motion carries 619 to 63. We will now move to Article 19, uh, dealing with the rail trail. Article 19 is on page 55 of your blue book. I could ask Mr. Cohn to make the motion. Mr. Cohn. 
Mr. Moderator, I move the town vote to, one, authorize the Board of Selectmen to enter into a lease agreement with the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority substantially in the form of the MBTA standard form of lease, including some or all of the changes requested by the town in the town's proposed form of lease, both filed in the office of the town clerk on April 14th, 2017, and with such other or further terms and conditions as the selectmen may determine in, on, over, across, under, and along the leased premises defined in the lease agreement as consisting of approximately 2.38 plus or minus miles, 12,588 plus or minus feet of the Dover Secondary Branch Railroad right of way, also known as Bay Colony Railroad Line or right of way within the town of Dover, the right of way, extending from the south sideline of Hunt Drive to the northeast sideline of Dedham Street as shown on the plan prepared by Beals and Thomas Inc. dated February 16th, 2017, entitled Lease Exhibit Plan Attached Thereto as Exhibit A-1 for the purposes of laying out, establishing, constructing, operating, and maintaining a multi-use path for non-motorized transportation, open space and recreation purposes, and for all other purposes for which rail trails are now or hereafter may be used in the Commonwealth. Two, authorize that the lease agreement may include options for the town to lease the optional leased premises consisting of A, approximately 0 0.26 plus or minus miles, 1,368 plus or minus feet of the right of way extending from the Medfield slash Dover town line to the south sideline of Hunt Drive, and B, approximately 0 0.89 plus or minus miles, 4,724 plus or minus feet of the right of way extending from the northeast sideline of Dedham Street to the west sideline of Center Street as shown on the lease exhibit plan, provided, however, that a further affirmative vote of town meeting shall be required before the Board of Selectmen is authorized to exercise either or both of these options, and three, authorize the Board of Selectmen to accept gifts and grants of funds for these purposes. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Alders. Now, the discussion for this uh, motion is going to proceed in three parts. We'll first be turning to Robin Hunter, Chair of the Board of Selectmen, for an overview and historical update of the process. Then we'll be turning to Kevin Bann, uh, one of the proponents who will present the case in favor of authorizing the Board of Selectmen to enter in the rail trail. And then Ralph Schlenker will represent the case in opposition to authorizing the Board of Selectmen to uh, enter into a lease or to negotiate a lease for the rail trail. Each of these speakers will be limited to 10 minutes. After they've made the presentation, and the purpose of doing this, by the way, is to ensure that most of the facts are set forth in a cohesive, concise manner, we will open it up for discussion, and I'll ask you to queue up uh, behind the microphones at the end of each aisle. So first, I would like to start with our chair of the Board of Selectmen, Robin Hunter. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So some of you may be wondering, why are we here again voting about the rail trail? So just a little reminder, because again, this is historic perspective. At last year's town meeting, the town at town meeting authorized the Board of Selectmen to go and negotiate a lease with the MBTA and bring that meet, lease back to town meeting for the town to vote on. Believe it or not, we began this process in June. And unfortunately, we are still in the process of negotiating the lease with the MBTA. However, we started with the form of lease. That is the lease that many of our surrounding towns have already entered into. We made amendments to, those, to that lease, and we have worked with the MBTA's consultant, the MBTA being the large bureaucracy that it is, will not negotiate directly with the town. So we worked with their consultant, and at this point, the negotiated lease that we have with the consultant is at the MBTA, and according to the consultant, they need approximately 60 approvals. We had hoped to get those by this evening, but unfortunately, we did not. So one may wonder, well, why are we coming to town meeting with that lease? 
And um, that is because what we are presenting to all of you at town meeting is the standard form of lease that all the other towns or surrounding neighbors have entered into, along with the changes that we as the Board of Selectmen have negotiated. The reality of the situation is we'll probably end up somewhere in the middle, but providing you with the spectrum of where we may, ge may, may land up will allow the town, if they so wish, to authorize the Board of Selectmen to move forward. One of the key points in our lease negotiation and a deal breaker is the lease premises. At last year's town meeting, the town meeting authorized us only to negotiate for a lease from Hunt Drive to Springdale. The entire rail bed is longer than that. It actually goes to the, Nita, to the Medfield line and then to the Charles River in Needham. If the MBTA were to come back and say, you have to take the whole rail bed, we would have to walk away. We also asked the MBTA for options. We asked for, to lease the lease premises and then for options in case at a later date we would want to lease the portion from Hunt Drive to Medfield or the portion from Springdale to the Charles River. In order for us to exercise those options, we would once again need to come back to town meeting. As far as the term of the lease goes, the terms are 99 years. We asked for 25, 25, 25, and 24. I'm an accountant, I should know how to count. But, um, so that adds up to 99, but we asked for automatic renewals or, or, or not to have to, so, so that we wouldn't potentially have to lease it for the entire time. We also asked for the dollars for, from salvaging the rails to come back to us. Um, we asked for items when you return the lease premises to return them as, as, as is rather than to restore the grade. We asked for certain indemnity exceptions. Um, next slide. We asked for clarification on abandonment and limitation on liability for um, un under the Tort Claim Act. Many of these items are nice to haves. They aren't need to haves. And with the exception of item one, which is the lease premises. A lot has been talked about regarding the environmental liability. So I would like to just spend some time reviewing that. As we all know, a lot of work has been done by town consultants uh, based upon their studies, which are in a feasib feasibility study. There was also a rail trail committee that put together, together an extensive study. What we know today, the contaminants should be limited to those contaminants used during rail management. That usually, those contaminants are from trying to limit the growth of the, of, the, of the brush on the rail trail. So we do know that there, there are contaminants in the soil. Those, those contaminants are there today. However, the DEP best management practices suggest that you remove the rails, you remove the rail ties, thereby removing the source of the contamination, and then you create a barrier of that contamination, and that barrier can consist of asphalt or, or a stone dust barrier, which is the preferred method for the, road, for the Dover Greenway if it, if it is to become a reality. We also will purchase environmental insurance. It, as we have stated before, the environmental insurance does exclude coverage for known contaminants. That may sound risky, However, from what we know and what our environmental consultants have told us is that the remedy is a rail trail. So by containing the contaminants, you are basically doing your remediation. There is a market out there. Here's a list of four quotes that we got. The quotes range between um, 21,000 
to 30,000. So there is a vital, a vibrant industry there. Last year when we came to town meeting, there was a lot of discussion about AIG exiting, but we do know there's some really great carriers in which we could buy insurance from. I, a couple of clarifications that I would make, I would like to make in the next section um, about comments that have been, um, that town employees or consultants have, have made or have suggested that they've made. So the first one is, and I've been asked about this on numerous occasions, is in the Beals and Thomas report, they had stated that no access is permitted from any point other than designated points on the rail trail. I have had various conversations with Beals and Thomas, and I would like to clarify those. Beals and Thomas suggests that, that you can access the rail bed from various locations, even from your backyard. Best management practices, however, says that the, the um, the person in charge or the division in the town in charge of managing the bed needs to make sure through visual inspections that none of the cover or the stone dust or the asphalt has come up and so that there will not be contact with the contaminated soils. So to clarify that statement, there, there can be access from various locations. We will, make, we will monitor to make sure that the barriers are in place. And we will also, in the design process, make minutes, sure please. that there's access to other trails. There was also a statement made about property values decreasing by 7% with public access. That was attributed to a comment that was made by the consultant that we use for Springdale. Um, that, can, that fact should not be leveraged to the rail trail. The comment made by our consultant on Springdale was specifically for the Springdale property and for putting in public access on the front of the property, a newly created public access. The third item is whether that has been stated is that the cost of management, of emergency management services will go up in the town. I have talked to the, the police chief, the uh, head of highway and fire, and both of them have assured me that they will be able to deliver services that they deliver today at, at not an extra cost. So lastly, what does a yes vote mean this evening? A yes vote at town meeting will, will mean that the Board of Selectmen are authorized to execute a lease so long as a couple of items or criteria are met. First, that the lease premises are Hunt Drive to Springdale, that Three town seconds, council please. confirms that the final lease is not different from the draft leases discussed or substantively different at town meeting, that the Board of Selectmen with Council will negotiate an MOU with Friends of the Dover Greenway, and that sufficient funds will be raised and put in a bank account so that the rail trail can be constructed and that future maintenance can also be performed. If we vote no, the Board of Selectmen will discontinue the negotiations. However, the town does not have exclusive rights to this rail bed. The MBTA has entered into leases with numerous other nonprofits as well as um, utility companies. And a lease negotiated by, by, not by Dover, we will have little involvement other than to ensure that our limited, that our laws or such as our conservation laws, wetlands regulations. Time, Ms. Hunter. Thank you. Okay. Please hold your applause until after we have a vote on this matter so we don't lose any time. Next, Kevin, so we've now heard from the Board of Selectmen, we would like to hear, or from the Chair of the Board of Selectmen, we would like to now hear from Kevin Ban, who will speak on behalf, in favor of the motion, and then we'll hear from Ralph Schlanker, who will speak in opposition. Mr. Ban? Speak, speak very close to the microphone, Kevin. Okay, when you're short, it's yeah, sorry about that. For 
first slide. Can you hear me now okay? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kevin Van. I live at 7 Pleasant Street. Um, there's a lot going on in this slide. On the left side, you see an unused rail. On the right side, you see a converted recreational path. It's very similar to the one that we envision. But there's something else in this picture. There's a long road in this picture. This town started talking about the rail trail back in uh, about eight years ago, if I have it right. So this has been a really long process. It started with a committee um, that learned as much as it could. And there have been a lot of people who have participated and contributed to this. I want to thank all of those people, whether you are in favor or whether you are against. You asked us hard questions. You made us do a deep dive. You made us be better. And that's the right thing for our town. I also want to thank the Board of Selectmen. You have done a wonderful job of due diligence, and that's important too. Now, the trail that we've ended up with over that iterative process is an exciting one. It is one that maximizes benefit to this town, and it minimizes cost and risk. And I want to take us through that next slide. The first piece that's important to know is that there will be no impact on taxes. The Friends of the Dover Greenway have committed to raising these funds independent of raising taxes. This is a local Dover trail that was brought up in the presentation before. It will start in the center of town. It'll run south to, to Hunt Drive. That has also been an iterative process. That has been talking to our neighbors. This is not a trail that will run north of town. It won't be uh, in the direction of, of Haven Terrace or Center Street. Neither will it connect with Needham or Medfield. Fundamental to this is that we gain control of a piece of property right now that is not ours, that runs through the center of our town. This plan will protect our environment. Lastly, and very important, and this was already mentioned, we do not assume responsibility for any historical liability. Next slide, please. So I want to, I want to go a little bit deeper on this. This is important. Now, when you were coming over here tonight or over the last few days, you may have seen some signs, maybe one or two that said, no soil testing, no rail trail, maybe one or two. Um, let's be very clear about this. The historical liability remains with the previous owner, in this case, the MBTA. The historical liability does not in any way get shifted to our town. In fact, the state is so interested in towns converting unused rail into a recreational path that they've created legislation through 21E that protects us. Before we do anything, we are protected, and that historical liability is put on the previous owner, again, the MBTA. Not only, as a part of the lease, we will, and we talked about this as well, take out an insurance policy to cover us further. Regardless of what happens during this process, we are following best practices in how to build a rail trail. And this is the best way to mitigate any problems that might exist. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not the right person. So any questions you might have about this liability, please direct them to the Board of Selectmen who understand this well and to our town council. We've worked closely with them. We've done a real deep dive on this. Please direct the questions to them. Next slide. But what about the environmental impact? We have taken this particular issue very seriously. We have engaged multiple experts. In fact, we have three licensed site professionals who live in this town. They published this article in the paper last year and this year. And essentially, it sums up, it can be summed up like this. The rail trail for this town is an environmental plus, especially for the people who are butters to the rail. Next slide. This is a trail for everyone. This is a unique trail. It's different. It's ADA friendly. It's safe for all ages. 
and it supports Dover's master plan of correcting, or excuse me, connecting recreational areas that we own. There's another important point on this slide and I want to point it out to you. Over the course of the last year and more recently, we've gotten to know the folks of the Norfolk Hunt Club. Last year, they expressed concerns <laughs> that this would infringe upon their tradition and their access. I pledge this tonight. We've connected with them, DA, I think George Cimento is here. For as long as the friends of the Dover Greenway are involved in this project, we will work tirelessly with the Norfolk Hunt to protect their tradition and their access to property to ride their horses. That is a promise I will make it to you tonight. Not only, there's been a lot of talk about safety, about crime, about property values. The data clearly shows thousands of miles of rails that have been converted to trails in this country, that it is net overall benefit positive. Next slide. I mentioned earlier that there would be no financial impact in terms of taxpayer dollars. The town will not sign this lease until the funds are appropriated and put into account. I will make this very simple. No funds, no rail trail. Next slide. What if we vote no? Make no doubt about this. This lease is up for grabs. We have a couple of local examples of towns nearby, Weston and Sudbury. Weston voted against a rail trail. DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, came in, got the MBTA lease, and is now constructing a, an asphalt rail trail through their town, connecting 20 miles of trail. Sudbury also voted no. Eversource has captured that lease and is putting in high power wires. Whether or not you're passionate about the rail trail like, like I am or the friends of the Dover Greenway and many people, whether you're really, you're not sure, you're not that interested, please vote in favor of acquiring this stretch of land that runs through the center of our town so we can maintain control. Next slide. I will come back to this has been a long road. We have learned a lot, but this is the moment. This is the moment where we decide that this is good for our town. So please join me in what will become a legacy for this town and vote in favor of Article 19. Thank you. Please hold your applause. Next speaker will be Ralph Schlanker. Not as tall as Mr. Band, so bear with me a second. Can you all hear me? Good evening. My name is Ralph Schlenker. I live at 30 Donnelly Drive. My wife and I have been there for 27 years. I'm going to talk to you tonight about hopefully voting no on this article, but before I do, I'd like to deal with some misinformation that's been circulated. Next slide, please. Misinformation deals primarily in two areas. One relates to Eversource. You've been told and led to believe that you need to make this conversion to a rail trail to prevent Eversource from coming in and running transmission lines down that corridor. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Eversource, as a utility, has a right to run transmission lines down that corridor with or without a rail trail. They are responsible, and that decision is only uh, acknowledged and, and decided by the state siting board. Uh, the, the board will take input from towns, but it is their ultimate decision. The good news is 
that in Dover, power comes into the town in a number of different directions, and as a result, there, the corridor does not do any good for, for distributing that power. The, uh, if it were the case that that corridor was useful for every source, you would have had power lines down there a long time ago. Number two, the DCR. There's been a suggestion that they can come in and take the lease. That is true. However, there is a limitation, and this was discovered when the, uh, the exact proposal was on the table for the towns of Townsend and Grattan, that they could only do this in five-year increments. Their own legal counsel discovered this and didn't realize that that was the case. There is no appetite within the DCR to do this sort of thing and renew it every five years. Who would want to go through this process? Next slide, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a terrible deal. There are many unanswered questions. Without the answers, your decision should be no. I'm sure all of you would think carefully before taking on risk in your own lives. No person would sign a contract without knowing the details, and the deal before us takes on way too much risk for the town of Dover. Next slide. We have no negotiated lease to review and vote on tonight. As Mrs. Hunter said, last year's town meeting authorized the Board of Selection to negotiate more favorable terms with a wish list. The Board of Selectmen promised to bring the negotiated terms back for our review, but after a year, they have nothing to show you. Now, let me correct that. They do have something to show you. As of last week, they have amassed a legal bill in the amount of $56,693 to get to nothing. You are already on the hook for that. I do not believe the friends are going to reimburse the town for that $56,000. You, the taxpayers, already own that. So after failing, the Board of Selecting is now asking us to trust them with a blank check. Do you really think they want to do that or we should do that? And also, why did town council engage in discussions with the options for the other two sections when that was not part of the authorization from last year? Next slide, please. Environmental contamination is terribly important, but it's most important to understand, first of all, where the bulk of the problem comes from. And that is from the coal used in steam locomotives that pretty much ran on every railroad line in the country. Lead and arsenic is in the coal. It doesn't burn. It goes up the stack as particulate matter and then settles back down on the railroad bed. We're not just talking about the creosote and the ties here. We're talking about some serious stuff. The MBTA standard lease prevents any environmental testing before signing. Gee, I wonder why that is. Once signed, all liability for any contaminated contamination or cleanup belongs to the lessee, not the MBTA, not predecessor railroads. Clearly, the MBTA is trying to shed responsibility and foist that onto unsuspecting towns, taxpayers, and future generations. Liability insurance only protects for future events and not what's already in the ground. As was indicated, municipalities are partially shielded, partially shielded from some liability, but a number of criteria must be met. And I would like to quote from a letter that town council, Mr. Anderson, sent to the Board of Selectmen, April 21st, 2016. He says, quote, it is an oversimplification to state that the available protection is absolute. Oversimplification to state that the protection is absolute. Finally, I would like to point out that environmental regulations do not remain the same. They change over time. And when they change, they're never in a more gentle or easier uh, direction, it's always more restrictive. Next slide, please. Long-term maintenance and costs. A thorough, careful, and robust analysis has not been done. A partial, simplistic attempt shows up in the Bills and Thomas report. But let's remember that the principal author of that report is himself an advocate for rail trails in the town of Holliston. A good analysis would consider the cost of labor, materials, and equipment to maintain the trail for 25, 50, or even 99 years. What's the cost of protective services over that period of time? The number of personnel, equipment needed, whatever it may be. How about surface maintenance? How long will one application of stone dust last when we have storm erosion and traffic? Embankments. Again, you're not supposed to scamper up and down the embankments lest you disturb those contaminants that I talked about earlier. Is there any cost of maintaining those embankments? What about litter, trash, animal waste? Who's going to do this? How often are they going to do it? 
We have fallen branches and trees that fall down in this part of the country. We've had windstorms and winter storms this year. And encroaching vegetation. As was mentioned, the railroad used to spray herbicide, not just on the tracks, but on the sides of it to keep the vegetation from growing back in. What's the plan and the cost for that? The Friends commitment, I believe, is $40,000 over 10 years. Is that correct? For maintenance? Um, will that be enough? What happens starting in year 11? Will the volunteers do this work or will it fall in the town of Dover? You also have the issue of tax abatements for houses which are along the railroad bed. We talk again about land vest in 46 Springdale. That consultant did state the 7% reduction in home values is because of trails that are next to a home where people, bicycles, and dogs walk. There are about 70 properties in this category in the town. Any deficiency there because of abatements will have to be made up by the rest of us. And if those other two segments that town council keeps talking about are ultimately developed, who pays for that? Probably the taxpayers of Dover. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the impacts. A lot of talk about privacy screening has been raised. Sadly, very few resources are dedicated. Mr. Ban, the president of the Friends, has stated at a warrant committee open hearing that funds are not budgeted for customized screening. By way of comparison, the proponents of the rail bed in Townsend and Groton reserved 20% of their budget for privacy screening. If the friends aren't getting to foot this bill, will the town pay for it? Or will it fall upon individual homeowners? Clearly, some visual and sound barriers are necessary. Let's talk about parking. One of the studies indicated that at the center of town, we would have over 100 spaces available. Where? At Too the townhouse? Places along Springdale Avenue, the Carroll Center, church lots, highway garage, Dover Market, Whiting Street, Legion Hall, Town Library, at Hunt Drive, and there's a picture of it up there, I think, yes. Um, it's a narrow two-lane road. There's a 90-degree turn in the middle of that, and that's a short distance from the rail bed. About six or eight weeks ago on a Saturday night, there was a party at the house that's right on the corner of the bend there. Cars were parked on both sides of the road. How do I know? My wife and I went out for dinner at about 8.30 that night. You could barely get a car through the remaining space. I can assure you, you could not get an ambulance or a fire truck through that space. Why is that important? Hunt Drive is part of the, the preferred method for emergency vehicles responding from the center of town to the regional schools. They go down Center Street, Hunt Drive, and Donnelly Drive. It's the quickest way for those vehicles to get there. That's an important issue, I think, for everyone to consider. Crime, yes, there is some crime. I'm sure all of you have heard that in December of 2016 on the Upper Charles River Trail in Milford, a woman was hit on the head from behind. She was not wearing headphones. She was knocked to the ground and attacked by a man with a knife. In November, in Fall River, last November, a man was accosted by three individuals. They demanded money, he refused. He was shot in the back of the head with a BB gun. In uh, Newbury Port this year, uh, a car was set on fire and driven in there. There are other impacts for the Hunt Club and the Dover Valley ecosystem, which I won't go into because I know others. Next slide, please. Local trail. I don't think it's likely that this is going to stay a very limited local trail. In Needham, the proponents known as the Bay Colony Rail Trail have been talking about a multi-town trail for years. In Medfield, they just completed a study last year that said the Bay Colony Rail Trail is a proposed path seven miles long through three towns, Needham, Dover, and Medfield. And it goes on to say there are opportunities to extend northeast into Newton, southwest into Millis. And finally, the Bay Colony Rail Trail Association Facebook states that the Medfield portion will connect to the Bay Circuit Trail at Ice House Road. That's where the Kingsbury Club is, if you don't know. The Bay Circuit Trail is shown in this map, Time, Mr. 37 Speaker. communities, 230 miles. Please. <laughs> talking to the microphone. And saying no to this article and preserving Dover the way it has been, we need to put this divisiveness behind us and learn how to be residents and friends again. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, now we'll open it up for general discussion. If you would like to make a comment, please come up to the front of the auditorium. Uh, people from the cafeteria are also invited to come and queue up. If you are unable to stand in line, raise your hand and I will call on people who are seated in proportion to the number of people that are lined up behind the microphone. Okay, let me start. And I would remind people that you should limit your comments to two minutes and also simply talk about new facts or new perspectives. Do not repeat what has already been said. Sir, could you state your name and address, please? Alan Moss, Haven Street. Uh, I'd like to thank the presenters for their talks. Uh, I'd like to comment that the prior presentation made this sound like a very scary proposition, which makes you wonder why 70 communities have already done this in Dover. I want to clarify two points. Firstly, no town has ever had to acquire responsibility from the MBTA for a cleanup. The second point is no town that's developed their own rail trail has had to have a power line put in on top of it when they've already acquired their own rail trail. In fact, we're more likely to find the Dover demon here than to find any of these uh, scenarios that have been outlined. Please hold your applause. This microphone, state your name and address, please, sir. I'm Ken, I'm Ken Randell. Ken Randell. I live at 21 Claybrook Road. I've lived in Dover for 34 years. I've been a member of the Sierra Club for 60 years, the Appalachian Mountain Club for 56 years, the board of directors. I created a fund for trail maintenance of a million dollars at Appalachian Mountain Club. So it gives you an idea, my perspective on this. Um, when I read about all of this, I thought this was fantastic. Um, I mean, this all makes great sense. Um, I read about the uh, Dover Friends of the Greenway. They're going to raise a million dollars. It won't cost the town anything. So I thought that this would really go through as a breeze. But then I read what this was all about tonight. And it isn't about any of the things everybody's been talking about. And I, I mean, it's quite amazing. Um, everything sounds wonderful, except that is not what we're being asked to vote on tonight. There's nothing in here about finance. It says that the Dover selectmen can accept money. It doesn't say that the, who is going to pay for this. It doesn't say that the town is not going to pay for it. When you, you listen to all of this, you have to go back to what was read earlier. And incidentally, this is not what's in the, the blue book, which I didn't appreciate, not knowing until the last minute that the motion tonight is not the same thing. To go back to what this says, this authorizes the Board of Selectmen to enter into a lease agreement, Mass Bay, MBTA, substantially in the form of the MBTA standard form of lease. 30 seconds, sir. Including various things that the selectmen can inside, decide to do and not to do. I am all for trails. Nobody here has any greater commitment than I do. But this is a really bad deal. And we have to really pay attention to why are we being presented with something that has nothing to do with all the great ideas that have been put, put forward tonight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Gentlemen, please state your name and, tell, uh, and address. Matthew Schmidt, 27 Pine Street. I put everything in writing so I'd stay within the two minutes. Very good. I am saddened and dismayed by the now five-year-old controversy on an issue that should have been settled years ago. I grew up in Dover, enjoying weekend walks along the railroad tracks through the rock cuts, taking, taking in magnificent views of the Dover Hills. Occasionally, the Norfolk Hunt Club politely asked us to keep our dog in as the spe spectacular horses and hounds thundered through. Cooperation was a given. Just as today, controversy, some producing salty language, was a part of our fabric. But issues were always resolved and residents continued to be devoted to a spirit of community. Individuals who banded together to ward off development, like my father, are forgotten, but saved properties of Springdale and Valley Farm will be forever appreciated by everyone. And need I remind you of selfless benefactors like Amelia Peabody. Yet here we are, in spite of all the facts dictating the benefits of a nearly three-mile corridor of historical engineering and beauty on 75 acres of land that is currently owned and controlled by a faceless bureaucracy, 
which doesn't pay a dime to, of tax to Dover, let alone give a damn about the Dover community. Wake up, fellow residents. Think of the consequences of a negative vote. Don't let short-sightedness and distortion of the facts sway you. Think, on the other hand, of the legacy that you could be a part of, on a par with the likes of Miss Peabody's generosity. Think of those who will come long after we are gone, thanking the forgotten volunteers who have participated to affect some control of land for residents, young and old, in the heart of Dover. Vote for the true spirit of Dover. I implore you to vote yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, please state your name and address. Thank you. Ed Tortolot, 21A Farm Street. Uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of the folks wondering, how can you still oppose this after we cut the ends off? Maybe I can help you understand my perspective. Um, how many people have been out to the Needham, the Needham Rail Trail? About five, ten percent. Um, I've been out there a few times. I'm sitting between a couple of rail trail supporters. Never been there. Family's never been there. This is exactly what you guys want, and it's right there. It's like one minute from the center of Dover, and nobody's on it. I probably used it more than almost everyone here. My boys used it more than all you put together. I'm pretty sure. And there's nobody there. It's like the gym that you join for 10 bucks a month and you never go to, right? <laughs> Except this gym isn't 10 bucks a month. It's a century of liability and maintenance costs. And you can't quit. You can't quit till long after you're dead. Your kids can't quit it. And their kids can maybe quit it, but they're going to be pretty old by then. So, you know, you might say, <clears throat> all right, there's no, no people on there. What's the big deal? What, what the big deal is, what, what it shows is this is never about the segment. This thing has always been about a long interconnected rail trail. That's the only context in which this makes any sense. And that this is viewed by the majority of, of uh, I'd say the core supporters as a step in that direction. Uh, kudos, they believe their own propaganda that once we see it, we're all gonna love it and we're gonna ask for more. Uh, I know not everyone you know, wants the rest of it, but this is, this is what it is. Why, why push so hard to have us uh, agree to something we don't have the lease on? I mean, this is, all right, that's about it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, please say your name and address. Thank you, Mr. Rupetti. I'm Sarah Molyneux, 7 Wilsondale Street. I've lived in Dover for 38 years. The arguments for keeping local control of the rail trail are persuasive and far-reaching. To keep local control, Dover would enter into the lease preventing anyone else, utilities, DCR, or a bike club from outside of Dover from entering into the lease. In Sudbury, residents voted no rail trail, and Eversource signed the lease. Are residents going to be able to seek a tax abatement about that? I doubt it. Concerned about privacy, traffic, environment? Again, we want local control. We have also heard the argument, how will the hounds of the Norfolk hunt negotiate the path? Myopia Hunt Club has 50 acres on which to exercise their hounds, and that meets their needs fully. Norfolk hunt has over 50 acres in Dover, and it's a long way from the kennel to the rail bed and you have to cross private property to get there. They claim they need to access their other 100 acres and cannot share the rail bed, which they do not own, nor do the hounds travel over it. 30 seconds, Sarah. This argument has been largely overstated. For this club to say their own needs supersede those of the broader community to walk in the woods without fear of deer ticks and on a flat, smooth surface is frankly an elitist argument. A friend took his bike to the Holliston Rail Trail on a beautiful Saturday last weekend, saw five people in one hour and a half reported not well used, saw two walkers, a retirement-aged husband and wife, biking, met an abutter on the trail who said, not once since its creation has it ever caused a problem. 
we should vote yes on Article 19 to get local control of the rail trail. Yes, so we have control over this singular feature of the town we love. Thank you. Um, <laughs> next speaker, please, uh, name and address. My name is Heather Hodgson DePaula, and I'm at 77 Main Street, and I have been here for five, over five decades. I don't know how I am going to vote for this. I am very torn. I was pleased to hear some of the arguments tonight by the rail trail supporters. I believe that if horse people, not necessarily just hunt people, but horse people are not affected by this trail and can freely cross, then that's cool. But I also have seen Dover changed. When I grew up here, there were over 5,000 horses here, more horses than residents. And I love horses. <laughs> Amelia Peabody loved horses. Chased Woodland people love horses. Your town is beautiful, and you perhaps moved here because of the open space. And if you were here forever, and I was a fox for the Norfolk Hunt Club for 25 years, walking over the entire country of this town over the rail trail, the steep or over the rail tracks, to lay my scent. 30 seconds. Yes. So I am not sure how I am going to vote, but I do not want to see this town change and lose its character because of this vote. And I need to learn more. I had hoped to hear George speak at the Historical Society, but I'm a mom now and I don't get out much. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much and please, let's preserve character of Dover. Thank you. Are there, uh, before I turn to the microphone on this side of the room, are there, is there anybody seated who would like to make a comment who is not able to come down to, the, to stand in line? Is it, does anybody have a hand up? No? It's hard to see in the lights here, but I don't see any hands. Okay. Ma'am, could you state your name and your address? Um, I'm Joanne Fisher, and I live at Six Clover Circle, and I probably shouldn't talk as long as anyone else because I've only been here five years, but I've been in the area a little longer. Um, I'm here tonight to ask you to vote tonight with an act of love. Love for families, children, elders, dog walkers, people who really want to enjoy the beautiful surroundings of Dover. Dover is a beautiful place, but unfortunately, a lot of it cannot be accessed. The roads are really too dangerous to walk. Those of us who try to, do it at our own risk. It's nerve-wracking to anyone here who drives a car to see children and adults walking, walking their dogs, walking alone, going to school, going to the, the market. We need, play, we need a place where we can show our love to all those families to show our love to those who may be handicapped and not able to negotiate the hills and the sharp turns of the roads here. So when all is said and done, I know that the selectmen can come up with a wonderful way to make an agreement with the MBTA. I know the funds can be raised. Um, they can be raised for schools. They can be raised for all the other things that make a town like this, a wonderful community. So again, I just ask you tonight to vote with an act of love. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rapella on the right, his name and address, sir. Andres Rapella, 15 Haven Terrace. Um, Andres Rapella, 15 Haven Terrace. Um, so um, I'm an opponent um, of the rail trail, uh, as many of you know. Um, my wife and I and our two grown kids have lived in Dover for uh, a dozen years. And uh, I, I am an immigrant from South America. 
amongst all of you, so I'm not an elitist in any way. Uh, and if in fact I've made many, many friends in this town, unlike many other communities I lived in uh, elsewhere. So I don't think any of you out there are elitist in any way either, from my perspective. All I'm asking you is, you've heard a lot about community tonight, right? Community is important, that's why we live here, we value it, it's critical. Um, but what we haven't heard about this rail trail is about other options. So we talk about an accessible trail. We talk about a trail that's um, going to be used by our seniors, or it's going to be used by those that maybe have disabilities, right? That's important, and I think that community is being disserviced today. So why not pursue that goal, and why not unite behind that goal as an entire community and actually select a location in town that can support such a trail, right? So, for example, we've invested well over $5 million in Springdale, 46 Springdale. We'll talk about that property later tonight. 30 um, seconds, sir. It's a flat property. It's already been studied in terms of environment. We've already paid for it. It's local to the downtown. Um, the restrooms will always be accessible at the community center. You don't walk away from downtown as you hit the Hunt Drive. You actually can stay there circularly within the same location. And it has open space in the center where the community could come together. So that's just an example. But do we really want a connected trail? Then I assume you'll vote yes. If you want a community building in our town and strengthening, then let's look at a location that can actually support that and not harm the neighbors on this corridor. Time, sir. Thank you. Gentleman on the left, uh, name and address, please. Hi, everyone. Nick Lacerdo. I live at 2 Morningside Drive. Uh, I've been a resident of the town for about 11 months, so I might be the newest one here. When I think about whether I'm going to vote yes or no, I tend to think, okay, am I well enough informed on what I'm voting yes or no for? And I'll be voting no tonight because I just don't think I have enough detail on what a yes vote would mean. So to me, there seems to be a, a lot of misconception about what the rail trail will or will not mean. So two, two things I want to point out tonight. One, parking. I live across the street in the Donnelly neighborhood. And parking at the Hunt end of the uh, proposed rail corridor just to me hasn't been discussed. It's not in the 2014 uh, rail assessment, and I haven't heard really any details on what parking will consist of. Will, will there be cars lined up along the street? Will, um, will land be taken by eminent domain? There was a question about six weeks ago at the open meeting, and that wasn't addressed. So parking to me seems like a big issue at the hunt end of uh, the proposed trail. Second, what is the town getting itself into? So we've heard tonight that the town is not going to have any liability for any past uh, hazardous issues or materials. I'm not expecting the answer tonight, but section 6.1 of the base lease, which I presume is going to be what, we're, what we'll be getting ourselves into because most of the proposed changes have been rejected. Um, it states that the town of Dover, the municipality, will agree to indemnify, defend, and hold harmless the MBTA from and against any and all liabilities, losses, damages, costs, expenses, yada, 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 um, by reason of any of the following occurrences, the activities of the municipality, members, or the public, that's A, or B, the discovery of any pre-existing hazardous materials. So, look, I don't know. There's a lot of people here that probably know more than me. Okay. Um, Maybe someone else can go. Uh, please address uh, your comments you. to the moderator, please. Uh, if you'd like to speak, please get in line. So if someone else could come up and explain, that would be great. And the last thing, I don't have any kids. I'd love to use the rail trail. I actually think it's a really great idea. I just don't think at this moment, with the information that's available, that it's the right idea right now. But I really do think eventually it would be a good thing. Time, sir. Lastly, there's not going to be any dogs allowed on the rail trail. So for anyone that thinks they're going to walk their dog, dog walkers, anyone else, according to the 2014 study, not permitted. So Sir, thank you. Another... Time is up. Thank you. Uh, before I move to the right-hand side microphone, is there anybody seated who would like a microphone brought to them? Uh, point of information, yes. 
Well, um, if you do not want to get in line, you can ask that we uh, move the question. Okay, there has been a motion to move the question. This is a non-debatable motion. Do I hear a second? Okay, motion to move the question has been made and seconded. This is a two-thirds vote. And I am going to tie, let people return to their seats in the gymnasium before we cast the vote because your response card will not work if you were assigned to the gymnasium, it will not work in the auditorium. So let's pause for a few seconds so that people can return to the gymnasium to vote. While they're doing that, let me remind you that a yes vote will be in favor of moving the question. A no vote will be opposed. Pressing one is yes in favor of moving the question. Pressing two is no in opposition to moving the question. Let me check to see if they've returned to the gymnasium. Okay, we will now start the voting. Now. Yes. Yes. Cafeteria. Cafeteria. Okay, the motion to, the motion to move the question carries from four, four, 475 votes in favor, 143 votes opposed. We now have to move directly to vote on the main motion. I cannot accept any more comments. Apologize. Okay. The vote passed by more than two thirds. So we will now move directly to vote the motion if you are in favor of authorizing the selectmen to conduct negotiations for a lease, you will be voting yes, pressing number one. If you are opposed to the motion, you will be pressing two, no. And I will tell you when to vote in a second. You may vote. This is majority. And this is a majority vote. The motion, please, the motion carries 470 to 243. Just a reminder, this could come up again. People can make a motion for reconsideration, so don't forget that no motion is safe until we adjourn the meeting. Now on to Article 20. Mr. Ben, for Article 20. I believe you were going to move to dismiss this. Yes. I, I'd like to move to dismiss Article 20. Okay, Article 20 was a citizen's petition that was largely repetitive of the uh, selectman's petition that we just voted on. Mr. Ban has made a motion that the article be dismissed. We need a second. Uh, Mr. Moss, if you could approach the microphone and identify yourself and second the motion. Moss Haven Street, I second the motion. Thank you very much. Motion has been made to dismiss Article 20. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion in the cafeteria? Okay, there's so no discussion. So in a second, we will move to a vote. If you press one, you are in favor of dismissing Article 20. If you press two, you're opposed. We will vote now. The vote has carried to dismiss Article 20 by a vote of 574 to 64. On to Article 21, Wildlife Study. Mr. Louie.
So, Mr. Liu, you'll make the motion, sir. This is a citizen's petition, so Mr. Louie will be making the motion. Okay, the motion to see if the town will vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to hire an accredited independent professional organization to conduct a wildlife habitat and biodiversity study as recommended by the Dover Master Plan of 2012. Such study to focus on the effects of the potential development of the land known as Bay Colony Railroad Line on right of way within the town of Dover on the land and habitat, habitat um, abutting and surrounding the railroad line on the right of way. Said study to be completed prior to the execution of the easement, leasehold or real property interests related to the aforementioned potential development and further to see if the town will raise and appropriate the sum of $15,700 for this purpose. Thank you, Mr. Louie. We're gonna hear a second. Please approach the microphone and identify yourself and your address. Andres Rapella, 15 Haven Terrace. I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Rapella. Okay, motion has been made for a wild oak study along the rail trail. Mr. Rapella has seconded. Uh, Mr. Louie is, has made the motion and will now have 10 minutes to explain the rationale for his motion. Mr. Louie. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Kevin Louie, and I live on Claybrook Road. My family and I moved to Dover from Brookline 18 years ago. We wanted to give our daughter, who was three at the time, the best possible childhood where she could be close to nature and discover the magic and beauty of the natural world around us. She grew up happy, healthy, and with a strong sense of community spirit. The friendship she she started at kindergarten, are still with her today. I was born and raised in New Zealand, which is considered by many as paradise on earth. And here I am in the small town of Dover, where I feel a strong sense of connection to the town because it has the habitat and conservation land. We in the town of Dover are extremely fortunate for many, this proximity to conserve land is the reason why we live here. This is why I am in front of you this evening. I believe it is important for all of us to fully understand any implications to our protected natural resources and hence we have brought forward this citizen's petition. Our next slide. We are requesting that the town of Dover do an independent study on the conservation land around the rail bed. We want everyone to understand that this study can take place during the diligence phase of the project, but before the 99 year lease is signed, it won't hold up the project. So I'll just restate that, it won't hold up the project. In fact, it will, it will provide the town with all the information it needs up front to make informed decisions that will help, help, the, help the selectmen proceed. Okay. Now we can tell you why the study is important. It is part of the Dover Master Plan written in 2012. Biodiversity is the, is the variety of life in the world or in a particular habitat or ecosystem. The town needs to review and understand how the project will impact, one, our town's biodiversity, two, our water supply and the aquifers that fill our wells, the wildlife and the nature resources in the area. A precedent has been set by the town when they completed the 46 Springdale study. 
During the study, the rail bed was identified as a significant wildlife corridor. So we need to, we need to check out on, on that area. The rail bed needs to be studied before construction begins. The, the black line on the rail bed is, is, is cuts right through the wildlife habitat area. The rail bed slices through the heart of the wildlife habitat area. When we say that the rail, rail bed would cut right through the wildlife area, people might say, so what? When you fragment or break contiguous habitat, you damage the, the biodiversity of the area and you reduce the ability to survive. The smaller the area, the more severe the effects. Next slide. Thank you. This is the wild woods. We paid $4.3 million to complete, to complete the Centre Street Conservation Corridor in 2001. Wildlife depends on contiguous open space. Very often people... Gee, I'm in trouble reading this. Very, very often people underestimate the effect of the actions of habitat and wildlife. And we have, we have an abundance of wildlife and wild, wild woods from the coyote to the turtle. We assume that these animals might, we assume these animals adapt to, adapt or move away, but this is not the case. Rare species don't survive and many move, and many move to the, to the roads as a way to go from one part of the habitat to the other. And we know what happens when, when, that, when they try to cross the roads. A, trails, a trail zone of influence depends on many factors. These changes to, to a team's surroundings may extend to hundreds of feet or thousands of feet on either side of the trail. The edges of the trails attract common species such as blue jays or raccoons and it, and it exposes the more vulnerable species wider out. Next slide. Thank you. This is the row. Sorry. Excuse me. I, I just need to I'm having trouble reading. I apologize, I was just having reading because of the light here. Okay. This is the railroad now, the land being reclaimed by nature. The wooden railroad are homes to small creatures like snakes and salamanders that you can see down below here. The 46 Springdale identified the rail bed as a significant wildlife corridor. Next slide, please. Look at this. The picture is from the Needham Rail Trail Constructions. We need the study before this happens in Dover. Next slide. Thank you. This study will cost 15700 for the entire rail bed and associated conservation lands. The result will be presented to the town near the end of the study. This study will assist in the town's due diligence process. Having the study done up front will save time and money later during the construction phase. This is not the same as the environmental notification form that the town will submit in this, to the state, as stated by the Warren Commission in the Blue Book. That form is a checklist that addresses many other engineering factors with no site visits onto our conservation land and open space. Next slide. To recap, we are looking for an independent study 
it will not hold up the project. It's called for in the master plan. The precedent was set with the 46 Springdale study. It is your responsibility to safeguard our natural resources for future generations. Voting yes for the study will help us understand how to proceed, how to, how to protect our natural world and to allow future generations, no matter what age or ability, to enjoy what we have now. We shall never take this for granted. If you lose it, it will be gone forever. It's very important to vote yes for the study. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Louis. Now I call upon Mark Healy. Mr. Healy, state your name and address. Hello? Can you hear me? Perfect. I'm Mark Healy, Meeting House Hill Road, and uh, I'm a science educator, an environmental steward, and a proud father of three in this terrific community. Article 21 concerns me um, in that it's a citizen's petition brought forth from the opponents of the rail trail. And my concern is that if you have a special interest initiative that's wrapped in a scientific study, there's a potential for the misuse of data and for findings to be determined to your liking, kind of for your purpose. There can be conflict of interest. Now, my previous presenter referenced the um, Dover Master Plan study and, and that the Springdale property set precedent, but I disagree. The Master Plan was really looking for kind of pictures, anecdotal data, um, not such a costly study to the town. If we look at this small area and the fact that they're asking for nearly $16,000 for the study, it sets precedence for the remaining 1,000 acres of conservation land that Dover owns, or if you expand the 3,000 acres through partnerships. Proportionally, that would amount to a tax spending value of several hundreds of thousands of dollars. If taxpayer money is petitioned for this cause, I'd certainly like to see more thoughtful planning and transparency as to how the results will be used to inform future decisions in our town. Next slide, please. When you look at this slide, we've actually used, um, my previous presenter used this image. This comes from the UMass Extension Center for Agricultural. And you'll notice they've shaded in the areas of habitats of statewide importance. What I hope you also notice is that the rail bed itself is not shaded. That was covered over in the previous slide with black marker. So, what we see is also much of the area along the rail bed is private property. We don't have permission to test on private property. Without consent, we can't guarantee that we'll have a complete scientific study. In my view, even if there is no bias involved, the science is not yet structured. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, one last thing. There are a few crossovers that are green in the previous slide. Um, what they reflect are culverts, which are just natural waterways beneath the track, where you can allow aquatic species safe travel beneath the trail. So, not only are we just changing the rail bed, but there's already a natural resource for ecosystem crossing without impact. Next slide, please. If you take a minute to read, um, this quote on top is really the result of the March 20th warrant hearing, where I asked a consultant from Be True to Dover, Rick Vanderpoel, what would happen if an endangered species were found along that green shaded area? Here's his reply. All I can say is that if I find something that would be a sensitive species that the state recognizes, then whomever is using the habitat would need to concur with the guidelines and the recommendations of the state. Now that very same night, George Cimento indicated that the Hunt Club uses about 100 acres of that land to train their 42 hounds multiple times a week, and that the dogs, the hounds run left and right of the track, all over that land. So if a yellow or blue spotted salamander were to be found, it could in fact limit the hunt club's use of that land. Next slide, please. I think this slide says a lot. We've invested $8 million of town money to access beautiful conservation land and to protect it for future generations. 
We clearly love our open space, but we value using that land. The Trust for Public Land offered Dover significant assistance in purchasing wild woods with the intent of creating parks and protecting land for people. They've also assisted communities in Massachusetts to create rail trails and greenways. If you examine the key points above relating to the abutting properties that we've paid over $8 million to access, you see that Article 21 jeopardizes the very vision for this land. In short, Article 21, as it stands, is a reckless proposal. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes my key points. And unfortunately, the shadow actually blocks the main idea here. <laughs> but please vote no on Article 21. Use your chance to press button two on the clicker. Look carefully at the pros and cons, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Healy. Well, now I'll open it up for questions or comments. Uh, please ask for new information or make new comments. Don't repeat what's already been said. And please queue up in the front here next to the microphone. Ma'am, could you say your name and address, please? Jill Seaman, 50 Center Street. I make a motion to move the question. Um, as the moderator, I have a lot of discretion in the rules that, of conduct, and I f want to make sure that we're not curtailing somebody's right to speak to the town. So before I entertain that motion, I would like to ask if there's anybody else who would like to speak. And if not, then we will move to that motion. Um, but I feel that town meeting is a place where neighbors get together. We disagree, but we disagree in a way that allows people to express their opinion. So before, since there have been no additional comments, let me just ask if anybody else would like to comment, any new questions or perspectives. If not, if you'd like to speak, sir, please go to the microphone. Yes. Well, that's what I'm trying to ascertain, sir. Thank you. I, excuse me. No one from the cafeteria. No one from the cafeteria. We, oh, okay, ma'am. Um, Name and address? Yes, Karen O'Sullivan, 103, 103 Center Street. I'm very dismayed by the laughing and the joking and the attitudes that I've seen when somebody was speaking. This is land that was given by families who have been here for a long time. There is a letter that was written by a Mr. Peter Wilde, an Olympic equestrian. His family transferred 200 acres of land. They loved the equestrian history. They loved the community of Medfield, Dover, Sherbert. And I think it's a disgrace that people are laughing and joking and throwing that back. It's a reflection of the personal emails that we have received and the way that we've been treated and spoken about as of today. So I'm, I, I'm very disappointed by the attitude. Thank you very much. Okay, okay another comment, ma'am. Name and address. Heather Hodgson. DePaula. DePaula, 77 Main Street. Um, my family also contributed 40 acres to Wild Woods. And I am a big, f I'm an AMC leader and I'm a big fan of wildlife. So, I am not so against this, and that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. If nobody else wishes to speak, I will now entertain the motion to move the question. Do I hear a second? Somebody please rise to the uh, microphone to second the motion, please. Alan Moss, Haven Street, I second the motion. Okay, motion has been seconded to move the question. This is non-debatable. When I give you the sign, if you're in favor of moving the question, please press one for yes. If you're opposed, please press two for no. And please wait for my sign to vote. You may vote now, thank you. Oh, we have a malfunction or? Oh, go ahead, vote.
Okay, the motion carries by more than two-thirds votes, 544 to 98. So we will now move to the main motion to vote upon uh, the funding of a wildlife study. If you are in favor of the citizens' motions, please press 1 for yes. If you're opposed, please press 2 for no, and please wait for my sign to vote. You may vote now. This is a majority vote. The motion fails, 165 in favor, 474 opposed. Okay, now we move to Article 22, dealing with an item commonly known as pay as you throw. Mrs. Canny. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town authorize the Board of Selectmen to enact a program to encourage recycling of solid waste, known as open quote, pay as you throw, P-A-Y-T, close quote, or, open quote, save money and reduce trash, smart, close quote, programs. Thank you, Mrs. Canny. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, Mrs. Gilbody has seconded. For discussion, we'll uh, turn to the committee. Uh, Chris Paulson has studied this. Mr. Paulson, could you uh, please come up to the front? Thank you, sir. And please state your address. Good evening. I'm can you hear me okay? I'm Christopher Paulson of 22 Tisdale Drive. I've uh, been a resident of Dover for 14 years. I've had three children come up through Chickering and up through the high school, middle school and high school system. I have uh, served on the uh, Dover Recycling Committee for about eight years and have chaired for the last six years. And it is my privilege to represent the efforts of not just the current uh, committee, but uh, probably five generations of Dover residents who have served on the committee and have uh, pressed for uh, a form of pay as you throw over the act, actually the decades. Uh, we have a proposal this evening uh, with uh, proposing just a very, very small, simple change to our current mode of trash disposal at the Dover transfer station. And that proposal, if that change is made, should reduce our trash, your trash, our solid waste by 20 to 30 percent. It should reduce the cost at the transfer station by a commensurate 20 to 30 percent, the disposal cost. And um, perhaps most importantly, it should reduce our contribution to uh, greenhouse gases and CO2s, uh, excuse me, CO2, again, a commensurate uh, 20 to 30 percent. And that uh, should get us in line with uh, our neighbors in other towns in Massachusetts. If you're one of the nearly 600 households in Dover that has their trash picked up by a commercial hauler, there's actually no change uh, to, to your current arrangements and no impact to you at all at the transfer station. Uh, this proposal reflects uh, several years of study and effort by the Dover Recycling Committee. This is not a hasty proposal. There's been, it's been a very public uh, very active uh, engagement with the community. Um, it's involved our very own superintendent of streets. There's been 12 interns from the Dover High School that we've, we've brought in over the years. Uh, we've solicited uh, technical assistance from uh, Mass uh, Department of Environmental Protection. And in fact, we have uh, um, Kate, um, uh, Kathy Mercer <laughs> uh, helping me out this evening. Uh, she's been engaged for the last two years. She's got 20 years of experience supporting municipalities uh, in the south and west of Boston on grant support and on uh, ways to reduce her solid waste. So Kathy will be helping me. We also have uh, Craig Hughes, who many of you uh, know uh, as well, uh, providing expert opinion on the operations of the transfer station. Next slide, please. This is a picture that many of you uh, might recognize. Um, it's actually at 7.45 in the morning a couple Saturdays ago, so um, it does not reflect the beehive of activity that you're normally accustomed to seeing at the transfer station. But sure enough, one hour later, it, it certainly uh, does reflect all that activity. Um, it is probably one of the most orderly and uh, clean operations that I've ever seen. In fact, 
Um, how many people have ever been to a transfer station or a dump that this is, in fact, and, and haven't had any smells? Like, there, there's no smells in our transfer station either. And Craig is very proud of that. Uh, surely, um, as you've been to this transfer station uh, and see all this activity, and you all have your own familiarity with your own recycling habits, that translates into a, an efficient town, a town with good recycling um, performance and, and waste management, correct? Well, unfortunately, that's, that's not the case. It, our perception is, is far from reality, and the numbers and uh, some pictures uh, show a very different story. Next slide, please. In, this is mass DEP data. It's uh, provided independently each year by towns. And in 2014, Dover was just in the last 10%, the worst 10% of towns in Massachusetts for solid waste. This is trash per household. We were uh, ranked 226 out of 240 towns that filed. Uh, there were only 14 towns worse than Dover. In 2015, we were 238 <coughs> out of 253 towns, uh, just 15 towns in front of us. We, we were just out of the bottom 5%. The, the lower chart is our track record in terms of solid waste per household. We had made some progress. Um, this goes back to 2003, up through 2009. And starting in 2009, we flatlined at about 2,100 pounds per household. And we have not made any progress on that. There have been efforts, initiatives. You'll see the next slide. Um, everything under the sun to, to get beyond that and get us in line with other towns. And it's just been, in, it's been a wall we have not been able to break. The, uh, to the far right of the slide, you can see in the blue and in the green, we're twice as much trash as towns that, per household, as towns that have pay-as-you-throw, and we're 30% greater than towns that uh, have no pay-as-you-throw. Um, many of you might attribute the amount of our trash to affluence. Well, um, there is correlation between trash and affluence, but we've put many affluent towns up on that chart in the top right and the top left. You may recognize many of them, and many of those affluent towns are performing much better than Dover. In fact, if you look at the towns that we're kind of ranked with, it's larger cities and not nearly as affluent. So there is a lot of improvement that we can and we should be making to our trash. Effectively, Dover's residents and Dover households are contributing twice as much trash as our neighbors. If the data doesn't convince you, next slide, please. A couple pictures. At the request of the uh, Warrant Committee, we, we undertook an audit uh, a few weeks ago, a couple months ago, actually, and we emptied out uh, one of the uh, uh, compactors. And uh, it may be very difficult to see in the back in some of the rooms, but the arrows there are, are pointing to recycled materials, plastics, papers, cardboards, fo foils, uh, plastic containers, cans, and the like. Um, several committee members present at there commented to me, our estimate was 30 to 35 percent of the material before us was recyclable. This sample that was uh, dumped out on the tarmac there was no different than what's in those compactors day in and day out. Another, next slide, please. Here's another picture close up. You'll see books, newspapers, magazines, all kinds of paraphernalia. Next slide, please. Here's another picture another day. This is looking in the top of the compactors you drive by. Uh, just another day, again, all kinds of cardboard, plastics, magazines, mail. Most of us, the reality is that most of us only see the transfer station as a busy enterprise. People running around, everybody's recycling. We spend five seconds at the compactor. That's perhaps the only part that smells a little bit. And we rush, rush off because someone's behind us. So people really do not know what, what is going into the compactors. <coughs> the reality is, is that some of our residents are not recycling. The reality is, many residents are not recycling as much as they should be. The reality is that 30% of our trash is recyclables. Next slide, please. Two minutes left. Okay, let me, let me just say that we have tried all forms of initiatives 
uh, over the last 20 years at uh, improving on the recycling rates. There's uh, grant money, there's alternative uh, forms of recycling we've introduced, there's uh, uh, initiatives, programs, events, everything under the sun. Next slide, please. With the flatlining that took place in 2009, we undertook a formal study to see uh, what we could do about solid waste reduction. In 2014, we engaged MassDEP. We had uh, high school students. We interviewed all the surrounding towns, Wellesley, Needham, Sherburne, uh, Medfield. Um, in 2016, we focused in on uh, solid waste reduction and pay as you throw. We interviewed North Brookfield, Duxbury, Littleton, Sandwich. We, uh, Again, uh, leverage DEP data. 146 towns in Massachusetts have implemented pay as you throw. They've all, every single one has experienced reductions in their solid waste, 20 to 50%. This has been a multi-year journey. Every initiative under the sun has been tried to reduce uh, recycling. Kathy has a couple words to say about pay as you throw and about the incentives and the dynamics that it creates in the community. Kathy. Hi, I'll be really brief. You have 30 I want to seconds, ma'am. Make sure, well, <laughs> Craig, to get to um, the actual proposal here. But if you go ahead, just two slides quickly, please. Uh, thank you. Um, the next one, please. Yes, the blue ribbon just represents communities that have pay as you throw programs. So you can see that they generate a lot less waste than communities uh, that don't have pay as you throw programs. And the single thing that really distinguishes them is to really price the trash program. Um, appropriately to send the correct signal that trash has a cost and so I just want to say it's a really sound policy both environmentally and cost-wise for the community to move ahead with this I don't know if we have a moment for Craig to actually address the proposal um, which is what was going to come next I'm sorry we've run out of time thank you, thank you. We um, have an unusual situation now where the Warren Committee has split on a recommendation with respect to this so we will now turn to the majority uh, of the Warren Committee for their report, and then we'll ask for the minority report. Mr. Stewart for the majority. Thank you. Just wait for the slide to come up, and then roll them through one by one. The, uh, the questions that we have, as uh, the moderator said, um, we were split, but the questions we had for the people who opposed this article is, are, do we need it? Next slide. Will it work and how can we improve? <coughs> Dover can do better in its recycling and waste reduction, but it isn't evident that pay as you throw is needed to accomplish it at this point. Next slide. Uh, our garbage waste disposal is not a utility. It's actually a municipal health, safety, and sanitation function. And next slide. It's not clear we need a pecuniary incentive. Um, for a free waste system, we actually do pretty well, despite the fact that there is, we believe, a minority of people who don't comply. Next. Before considering pay as you throw, we'd like to further assess the decrease in tonnage associated with the new regulations banning commercial waste haulers from tipping at the transfer station. Let's give that policy time and then reassess. Next. Next. The economic benefit or cost of moving to pay as you throw for Dover's budget is uncertain, frankly, and dependent upon significant reductions in solid waste disposal, even above the expected increase in recycling. It is not clear how those additional reductions will be achieved. A solid waste disposal is approximately 1% of the town budget. Next. Implementing pay-as-you-throw adds an unnecessary complexity and costs without directly assessing the changing behavior or changing the behavior of recycling of some. User fees, user fees for the transfer station are not necessary as most of the town households use it, approximately 70% of households, we believe, rather than other means, private haulers. Those who are paying for it are, the one, are largely the ones using it. Next. Will it work? Other town sites as examples have actually had, we believe, issues with abuse and overuse of their transfer station. That has not been the case in Dover. Most other towns also charge more for their pay as you throw bags than the amount being suggested for Dover. Are the economic incentives truly comparable? 
Most also charge for the annual sticker, which creates a whole different set of dynamics. Next. If pay-as-you-throw doesn't work as projected, will the, pay, will the uh, per bag prices be raised above the dollar uh, that was suggested? And, and finally, there is a lack of data or, or surveys about the attitudes and compliance with recycling in Dover. And as, as we mentioned before, um, pay-as-you-throw pay -as -you -throw penalizes all for the non-compliance of, we believe, a small minority. Uh, the numbers that we have been given uh, in terms of Dover's solid waste use is a total number, but what we don't have is the actual recycling amount. That estimate is, it was just an eyeball number um, based on a visit that we initiated. And frankly, um, it was a little bit misleading because we understand that the swap shop had just been dumped out and not recycled into that dumpster that day or the day before. Next. How can we improve? We can redouble the efforts at recycling and composting. We can make a concerted education and encouragement program. We can have practical and authoritative on-site guidance and instruction at the transfer station. Likely that could be very effective in fostering adherence. We can have proactive involvement. We can have volunteers. We can have increased signage. How many of you knew that pay-as-you-throw was going to be discussed other than in the blue book? Um, it, there was nothing at the transfer station that this was even being considered. Um, we should also consider um, periodic cha uh, changes in changing the, uh, the uh, uh, Dover resident uh, sticker because we understand that some people who are former residents are abusing that. Next. So we question whether or not pay-as-you-throw is the best initial step to foster increased recycling and conservation for Dover, and we don't think so. Next. And then finally, just to remind everybody of bird's eye view that there is a whole bunch of recycling um, uh, bins to use and to please use them. And let's really try to make this work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Now, uh, Ms. Kat Kathy Gilbody will present the minority report. Thank you. Um, so if we can have the first slide. Um, I'm just going to tell you that three members of the Warren Committee voted to support, strongly support Article 22. And I'm just going to briefly outline for you the main points that swayed us um, towards our recommendation. First, the Dover Recycling Committee selected this particular option for us to consider after extensive study um, and expects that Dover's solid waste can be reduced by up to 20 percent. Uh, the second main point is that pay-as-you-throw will not have a significant adverse effect on individual, household, or town finances. And third, that as a community we should be taking steps to reduce our solid waste. This is, this is a real problem. Um, and pay-as-you-throw is successful in communities that are similar to Dover. So I'm just going to dig down deeper into each of these um, points briefly. Thank you. Since 2014, the Dover Recycling Committee, in consultation with the Superintendent of Streets, the Town Administrators, the Board of Health, the Selectmen, and the personnel at the transfer station, have been studying various options to reduce solid waste. So this is not an initial step. This problem exists. There's been several prior efforts that have already focused on education, and development distribution of a pamphlet, for example, outlining for all of us all the materials that can be recycled in our town and where to bring them. That pamphlet, for example, is available on the town website. Statewide data demonstrates that over 40% of uh, Massachusetts towns have already institute pay-as-you-throw and that their waste reduction ranges from t over t 20 to 50% and there's been a very high level of satisfaction with residents once this program has been initiated. So from our perspective, pay-as-you-throw is an effective program in small towns like Dover with transfer stations as a way to manage their trash and the recyclables. Finally, options such as reminding residents to recycle at the time of disposal are unlikely to be effective from our perspective because at that point the trash is already bagged. This was a suggestion that was put forth in your blue book. 
coaching residents at the transfer station itself, aside from relying on volunteers, which may be difficult to recruit on a consistent basis, does not seem a good alternative from our perspective. Um, and there's also data, no data supporting that that's an effective um, approach, and there is data to support pay as you throw. Next slide, please. Pay-as-you-throw will require no additional town resources or personnel. We see pay-as-you-throw as a low-tech, low-cost approach. Choosing an option that does not add significant expenses at either the town or the resident level is a great next step to take. And our town can easily monitor changes in solid waste levels going forward to monitor the effectiveness of pay-as-you-throw. Our town collects this data anyhow, so it's that part of the system is already in place. We think that danger, uh, data that we could collect about changes in our solid waste would be more useful than collecting data about residents' attitudes or their current habits regarding solid waste and recycling. Next, unlike other Massachusetts committees, our transfer station does not charge for stickers, which typically can cost between $100 to $250 per year. Or, and it, we also don't have additional fees for single item bulk disposal, which can range between 10 and 20 or up to much higher than that in some communities for things like a, a mattress. So we're fortunate to have a transfer station from a financial perspective that manages operations without these additional fees. And finally, the annual cost per household to purchase these approved bags, which would be used, is expected to be between 39 and $56 per household. This fee we don't see as a large fee, and it would be distrib distributed equitably among um, resident users. Those that deliver more solid waste to the transfer station would pay more because they would simply be using more bags. And last slide. Most importantly, we should be taking steps now to address this problem. Pay as you throw would provide a small financial incentive to recycle and cut back on solid waste. It could also serve to increase awareness and motivate those who do not regularly recycle to improve how they manage trash. We do not see pay as you throw as a penalty, but rather a new program that would require us to change our habits. And these changes would affect each of us somewhat differently. For those that already produce low levels of waste, this change would probably mostly involve purchasing these new bags that would be a different color and using the designated trash bags in place of the trash bags that we're currently using. Time, Mrs. Gabay. For those that produce larger levels of trash, pay as you throw will require more change in habits. So that's really what we need to think about. The experience of the other communities and the data provided um, lend us, uh, have led us to believe that this is an effective um, option and that we should give it serious consideration now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If, if anybody would like to ask questions or make comments, please come up to the front aisle to the microphones. Yes, ma'am, state your name and address. Hi, Amelia Slosby on Normandy Road. I was just curious if the recycling committee could expand a little more on who, uh, I guess, designs, manufactures the bags, like where do we get those, and also what do we do about large items like a mattress, it's obviously not going to fit a trash bag. Would there be an additional cost for those large items? Okay, who would like to answer that question? Okay. Mr. Paulson? Yes, hi. There, there are uh, five vendors that are approved by the state that provide bags. They'll have different grade bags. They have large bags and small bags. In prior public forums we've presented, we've had the bags present and shared them. And let people touch and feel them. There's a uh, two months or three months that we have planned for following this vote to do due diligence on vendor selection on which bags that we would use. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Uh, yes. Mr. Rice, please direct your. No, please direct your. Anything that doesn't fit chair. in the bags is not charged for. So the only thing that costs, the only proposal for the pays you throw are the bags. So you just use these bags instead of the bags you currently use. That's the whole page you throw proposal. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Mr. Fleming, state your name and address. Jim Fleming, Fox 
Run Road. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, consider a substantial number of our neighbors recycle. Question, what is the correct tonnage for the town? Clear that we don't know that. Uh, plus, the current tonnage is down because we've been managing the facility better. What is, and get back to what is the appropriate tonnage. So, instead of rushing to a fee, a tax, a penalty, let's consider some other issues. Greater education and recycling. It was interesting comment. There was no flyers at the recycling center that this was coming. But it's, it's their biggest program. Recycling containers in town buildings, public buildings, town fields, trails. Uh, by the way, where are you going to throw this blue book when you leave tonight? Maybe, maybe the committee has recycling units out here that we can drop it off. 30 seconds, Mr. Fleming. Uh, all vehicles with permits, decals required. It's been a long time since the town re-permitted uh, cars. The other very key issue that's been avoided is that we haven't faced up to stricter control of access. You know, everyone wants to be a good guy and a good girl, but sometimes you've got to speak up and raise some questions and manage our facilities. Thank, thank you, Mr. Fleming. My last comment is <laughs> one last comment. Five seconds, Mr. Fleming. <laughs> it might be interpreted as it is okay not to recycle if you pay the penalty. And for those neighbors who, re who recycle could conclude that their efforts are not valued by the town. So pay the penalty and throw the trash. Vote no on this article. Thank and by the way... Thank you, Mr. Fleming. I'm sorry, sir. Time has expired. Mr. Fleming, you have to sit down. Sorry, sir. Mr. Schlanker, can you state your name and address? <laughs> it's a tough act to follow. Ralph Schlanker, 30 Donnelly Drive. I have a series of questions. Um, my understanding is we have two different size and color bags, and I probably should be asking this question of the gentleman behind me. I know. Hopefully he won't hit me over the head. Um, two different size bags, one for 50 cents, one for a dollar. Is that correct? Okay. I'm thinking of a trash compactor, which has a pretty heavy-duty bag on it. Um, Am I supposed to take the bag out of the trash compactor and put it in one of these bags? Is that correct? Okay. Just want to make sure that I get that straight. Uh, am I also understanding, and I think Mr. Stewart touched upon this, but it might require a little more amplification. Commercial haulers as of January 1st of this year are no longer allowed to bring their stuff to the transfer station in Dover. Is that correct? Okay, and the other thing I think I heard at the open warrant committee hearing is that about 600 households are served by those commercial haulers. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so we have 2,000 some odd households. 600 households are no longer going to be bringing their trash to that uh, location because of the commercial hauler ban. This is really a Bonnie Aiken's question. And the real issue, I think, is should we try to figure out how that works first before we do anything? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slanker. Uh, gentleman on the right, name and address, please. Well, my name is Heather Hodgson DePaula, and I'd really like to hear Craig first before I say anything. Uh, sorry, ma'am, but you're next in line, so please, uh, please make your comments, and then we'll turn. He will educate me. Please, could I have him speak next? No. <laughs> sorry. Fine. Please make your comments. Okay. Well, I am Heather Hodgson DePaula, 77 Main Street. Uh, I don't like change. I've been going to the dump since it's been a hole in the ground. 
I am an avid recycler. I actually worked with uh, Don Law, Charles Lacodera, and his wife to produce, produce a video, probably in the early 90s, about how to recycle. And I'm very educated. And I totally agree that people in this town do not recycle. <coughs> that is a different issue. I do not want to be taxed for being a good person. I probably, this won't cost me that much because I have very little trash, but it's the principle. I recycle, and I think that the recycling committee, or whoever it deems to be, should be at the dump. Our buddies at the dump, Wade, does a fanatical, uh, unbelievable job of taking things out of things that should be where they belong. Please don't interrupt the speaker. Well, it's true. And, um, you know, thank God for Wade. That's all I have to say. And he takes care of us. And the other point about no more uh, commercial vendors, the numbers are totally skewed. Uh, since they won't be doing it anymore, that's fine. Now, Craig, you may educate me more. But uh, I am against this tax. I am a good recycler, and I am a firm believer in education. And I think the recycling committee, I'd like to see you all at the dump. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hughes, if you could state your name and address, thank you. Uh, Craig Hughes, 3 Hughes Lane. Uh, sorry I wasn't able to get involved in the presentation. But I'll just, as a resident, I'll speak a little bit. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank the committee. I've never worked with a group of volunteers like I have in the last three years of this subcommittee that's done this unbelievable research. I can't believe the numbers, everything they did. Um, but I'd just like to say, you know, you hear how wonderful everybody thinks about Dover and our beautiful community and so forth. Well, it's my job as, an, as director of the transfer station and superintendent of streets and fire chief um, <laughs> to do a good job with the budgets and so forth. And when I, I see, you know, we're number one at, we try to strive ourselves at number one at everything, schools, public safety, finance committee, I will commend you very, very much every year. But when I see the number of 238 out of 256, that doesn't sit well with me, I'll tell you right now. We can do much better than that. This is not a problem, this program doesn't cost. There's no change, no change to the operation of the facility up there. It will work out just fine. I, I urge your support for it. You know, if we can save, and I believe, I could stand here next year and tell you, 80 to $100,000 a year by implementing this program, I think it's a good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Ma'am, uh, state name yes. and address. Diane Green, 119 Farm Street. I completely agree with what, with what um, Bubba said. I'm totally for the Pay As You Throw program. It has been proven to work in towns similar to ours. And I, I believe that um, we should have pride in our town for, for being green, for, for doing things for the environment. And this seems like a very simple, the committee has worked very hard to, to make it um, not monetarily um, uh, offensive to people. Uh, they've gone out of their way to do that. Um, and it, it seems as though we should be proud of our our waste as well, the same way that we are proud of our schools and our libraries and everything else in this town. So I urge you to please vote yes for this and make Dover greener for ourselves and our future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Before I turn to the next speaker, could I, uh, Ms. Molly, just a second, please. Um, could I ask, uh, is there anybody who was unable to come to the front who uh, would like to make some comments? Okay, there's a hand in the back. Uh, sir, I will come back to you after Ms. Molyneux makes her comments. Sarah Molyneux, 7 Wilsondale Street. You may not be aware that Dover began studying pay as you throw in the early 1990s, at the time other local towns began to adopt it. People in those towns, like Needham, are hardly, if at all, aware that they even have pay as you throw. It's normal. 
Dover has a low recycling rate, as Chris told you, compared to other towns of its size and demographics. We mandated recycling in the early 1990s, and yet our recycling rate percentage is six points below the national average. And as you heard, twice as much trash as our neighboring towns. There are economic, environmental, and social benefits to recycling. Think of recycling rather than mining bauxite for aluminum cans and of the long-term benefits of reducing methane production from landfills, a common and growing problem. Methane's climate change impact is 25 times greater than carbon dioxide's. That statistic alone convinces me that it is not time for further study, that encouraging residents to recycle more and decrease trash is certainly not premature and hasty, and inconvenient, as the Blue Book suggests. Perhaps it feels inconvenient to those who refuse to recycle. Credit is due, Wade and Mike, for the thought and the energy with which they run the transfer station. And Dover has done a great job with tracking metrics and with education. Please vote yes on this article. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen in the back, if you could bring a microphone to that gentleman. Sir, right behind you. If you, know, you could please state your name and address. Uh, Matt Spinali, Colonial Road. Uh, please move the question. Okay, a motion has been made to move the question. Do I hear a second? Somebody could please come to the microphone to second a motion. Second. Name and address, please. Sean Carell, Yorkshire Road. Thank you. Motion to move the question has been seconded. This is a two-thirds vote. If anybody was in the cafeteria, if you would like to return to the cafeteria now to vote, we'll pause for a few, for 30 seconds, and then you can come back if the motion doesn't carry. Tell him he just, yeah. Okay, tell him we have one going back. Okay, uh, one person has returned to the cafeteria. We have a motion to move the question. It has been seconded. This is not debatable. <laughs> Uh, at my cue, please vote yes in favor by pressing one or vote no if you're opposed to moving the question by pressing two. Are we ready yet? We're all set. You may vote. Okay, the motion to move the question has been passed by more than two-thirds votes. We will now move directly to consider the main motion, the pay-as-you-throw motion. If you are in favor of pay-as-you-throw, you would press one by voting yes. If you're opposed, you'll press two by voting no. And please vote on my cue. We're all set. You may vote. Okay, this was a majority vote. The article, the motion fails. 320 have voted in opposition to the motion. 221 have voted in favor. Okay. At this moment, we um, moved these articles ahead so we could make a decision whether we should try to proceed to complete the meeting, and I think we should. We're through most of the controversial items. Uh, with a little bit of luck, uh, we'll be out of here by 11:15 or so. Uh, please abide by our time constraints. We've been very strict, I know that, but I appreciate the respect that people have shown for other persons' times. The alternative would be to come back tomorrow <laughs> night, and I think it's much better to proceed now. I would like to therefore return back to Article 6, which is sponsored by the Selectmen and deals with the Unemployment Compensation Fund. Ms. Giblotti. Mr. Moderator. I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $10,000 for the purpose of funding an unemployment compensation fund as authorized by Chapter 40, Section 5E of the Massachusetts General Laws. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Stewart is seconded. Um, 
Any discussion with respect to this motion? <clears throat> Any discussion in the cafeteria? No discussion. We'll move directly to the vote. Mr. Fleming. Oh, Mr. Fleming. Okay, sorry, sir. Go ahead. Mr. Fleming, you can say your name and address. No, we can't hear Mr. Fleming. Speak very directly to the mic. Thank you. Could anyone step up and explain with a little detail where is this un where is the unemployment coming from? Okay, thank you, Mr. Fleming. With, um, somebody from the uh, David, do you? Uh, Mr. Ramsey, will the town administrator will answer that question? The town does not play, pay employment taxes for this purpose. We pay on a pay-as-you-go basis. So when somebody leaves the town, this fund pays for their unemployment dollar for dollar. I'll, I'll say, Mr. Fleming. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? None in the gymnasium? Okay. Uh, none in the cafeteria? Okay. Let's move directly to a vote then. Uh, the motion has been made. Uh, to fund the unemployment compensation fund to, by appropriating some of ten thousand dollars if you're in favor of this motion Please press one for yes if you're opposed, please press two for no and you may vote now Motion carries 324 to 33. Article 7, accumulated sick leave for retired police officers. Mr. Hamily. I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $10,000 for the purpose of payment of accumulated sick leave for retired police officers as authorized by Chapter 375 of the Acts of 1984. Thank you, Mr. Hamily. Do I hear a second? Second. Ms. Cherico has seconded. Is there any discussion with respect to this motion? If so, please come down to the front. Is there any discussion in the cafeteria? Okay, no discussion. Let's move directly to a vote on the motion. If you are in favor of raising the appropriate sum of $10,000 for accumulated sick leave for retired police officers, please vote yes by pressing one. If you're opposed, please vote no by pressing two on my cue. <coughs> Are we open? Yes? Okay, you may vote. Thank you. Please give me the sign. <laughs> the motion has carried 327 to 57. On to next article, Article 8. Establishment of a refund, revolving fund for use in town pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 53E, one half of the Massachusetts General Laws, and non-substantive changes in the numbering of this bylaw. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town adopt a general bylaw entitled Revolving Funds for the purpose of establishing revolving funds for use in town pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half of the Massachusetts General Laws as shown in the document on file in the office of the town clerk, and further, that non-substantive changes in the numbering of this bylaw be permitted in order that it be in compliance with the numbering format of the Dover Town Code. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Do I hear a second? Second. Ms. Gilbody has seconded. Is there any discussion with respect to this motion? Any discussion in the cafeteria? Okay, no discussion on this motion. So we'll move directly to a vote. If you're in favor of this motion, please press one to signify yes. If you're opposed, please press, press two to signify no. You may vote.
Motion carries 307 to 40. Okay, now we're on Article 9, authorization of revolving funds pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 53E and one half of the Massachusetts General Laws. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Moderator, I move that pursuant to the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, the town authorize the use of revolving fund accounts for the following boards or departments, and that such accounts shall not exceed the amounts set forth in the fiscal year. Number one, building department, A, gas inspector, $7,200. B, plumbing inspector, $17,500. C, wiring inspector, $29,500. Number two, board of health, A, perk and deep hole inspection and permitting, $40,000. B, septic inspection and permitting, $50,000. C, well inspection and permitting, $20,000. D, swimming pool inspection and permitting, $10,000. Number three, library. A, materials replacement, $5,000. Number four, council on aging. A, senior activities and transportation, $28,000. And further, that the fees charged for these services be credited to the respective accounts and that the aforementioned boards and departments be authorized to make expenditures from their respective accounts and for their respective purposes up to the amounts set forth above. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Any discussion in the cafeteria? No. Okay, no discussion. We'll move to a vote. If you're in favor of this vote, please signify yes by voting, pressing one. If you're opposed, please press two. You may vote now. Motion carries 337 to 24. Article 10, distribution of the annual town report. Ms. Alders. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town amend section one in chapter three of the general bylaws to allow for the change in method of distributing the annual town report by inserting the phrase, quote, by any means approved by the board of selectmen, end quote, after, quote, distribute among the voters of the town, end quote, in the first sentence of section 3-1. Thank you, Ms. Alders. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Gilbody. Ms. Weld, if we state your name and address. Uh, Kathy Weld, 29 Main Street, uh, Chairman of the Town Report Committee. So this article is the result of the Town Report Committee's recommendation to the Board of Selectmen that the town uh, increase the allowable options for distribution of the annual town reports to the townspeople. This rep represents an effort on our part to reduce printing and postage costs, to reduce paper weight from all the hard copy reports that are discarded every year, and to acknowledge the fact that the, in the 21st century, the trend is towards electronic d dissemination of information as being the most effective and in many ways preferred format. Although the town reports are available on the town's website, town council recently opined that the current bylaw language requires our present method of hard copy distribution to each home and P.O. box. Article 10's proposed language would help the efforts to achieve our goals by allowing flexibility for current and future boards of selectmen as to the distribution format, whether all hard copy, all electronic, or a combination of the two. The town report committee surveyed seven area towns of which one has retained all hard copy and the other six have a combination of electronic and hard copy distribution in which the percentage of hard copies ranges from 1% to 19% of the total required distribution and there are still overages. Uh, <clears throat> the town report committee will be working with the selectmen to create a town-wide survey to help determine how many hard copies we should continue to print and how we should make them available to our citizens. We will also be working to ensure that our current online version um, is easy to navigate. This article does not require a change in the method of distribution. 
it allows for such a change to be determined by the selectmen with input from the citizens. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Ms. Weld. Is there any further discussion of this motion? Any discussion in the cafeteria? Okay, let's move directly to a vote. If you are in favor of this motion, please press one to signify yes. If you're opposed, please press two to signify no. You may vote now. Motion carries 346 to 25. Article 11, Conservation Fund. Ms. Cherico. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $25,000 for the Conservation Fund to be used by the Conservation Commission for any purpose authorized by Chapter 40, Section 8C of the Massachusetts General Laws. Thank you, Ms. Cherico. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Gernard. Any discussion on this motion? I see no hands here. Is there any discussion in the cafeteria? Okay, no discussion. Let's move directly to a vote. If you're in favor of this, please press one for yes. Opposed, please press two for no. You may vote now. Motion carries 332 to 37. Article 13, capital equipment and or improvements for the Dover Shervin Regional School. Ms. Gilbuddy. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town appropriate the sum of $206,675.49 by transfer from free cash to be expended by the Dover Shervin Regional School Committee pursuant to an intergovernmental agreement entered into by the town of Dover on February 23, 2017, with the dover Sherbin Regional School District and the town of Sherbin, for the purpose of paying Dover's allocated costs of the following capital equipment and improvements. Replace boys' locker room lavatory waistline, $16,000. Replace IT head and AC units at end of useful life, $25,000. A variable frequency drive upgrade synchro flow system, $12,000. Additional funds to complete the Lindquist door project, $63,500. Upgrade EMS software and replace controllers, $135,000. VCT replacement, multiple areas, $48,000. Science area, replace lab hoods, purchase replacement parts, $23,500. Resurface tennis courts, $13,000. Various concrete repairs, $18,000. Replace the Anorix tank mixes, wastewater treatment facility, $10,700. For a total of $364,700, including the payment of all costs incidental and related thereto. Thank you, Ms. Gilbody. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Canny. Is there any discussion on this motion? Please check the cafeteria. Okay. Nobody wishing to discuss this, let's move directly to a vote. If you're in favor of the motion, please press 1 to signify yes. If you're opposed, please press no. You may vote. Press 2 to signify no. You may vote now. Thank you. Motion carries 335 to 27. Article 14, sponsored by the Dover Sherman Regional School Committee. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Moderator, I move that this article be dismissed. I hear a second. Second. Okay, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Stewart has moved that the motion be dismissed. Mrs. Gurnett has second. Any discussion? Any discussion in the cafeteria? 
Okay, let's move directly to a vote. Yes, press one if you want to vote yes. Press two if you want to vote no, you may vote now. Motion carries 323 to 13. <clears throat> okay, Article 15, Capital Budget Committee. Uh, Mr. Peterson? I move that this article be dismissed. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Ms. Cherico? Second. Okay, motion has been made to dismiss this. Any discussion? Any discussion in the cafeteria? Okay, we will move directly to a vote. One for yes, two for no. You may vote now. Motion carries 328 to 15. Article 16 is sponsored by the Planning Board and involves an amendment to the zoning bylaw. Mrs. Gilbody. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town amend the zoning bylaw by deleting section 185-35 entitled, quote, signs, unquote, and replacing it with the new section 185-35 entitled, quote, signs, unquote. The complete text of which is on file in the office of the town clerk and the planning board. Thank you, Ms. Gilbody. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Gerdin. Mr. Sarrow, the chair of the planning board, will present the planning board report as required by state statute. Uh, thank you, and I'll keep this streak going. This will be very brief. Uh, Mark Sarrow, Colonial Road, and, and planning board chair. Um, this article is the planning board's proposal to update the current sign by law. The sign by law is only one and a half pages, uh, but it's an important one and a half pages because it's in that bylaw that um, is what governs what the planning board uses in order to approve all of the signs in town other than traffic signs, signs on town-owned property, and signs in right-of-way, which are signs that the selectmen control. Um, this bylaw uh, is what we use to approve all other signs in town. Uh, this article doesn't involve any money, but it does require a two-thirds vote because it's a change to a zoning bylaw, and so that's the purpose of the article here. In a nutshell, it proposes changes to the bylaw in response to two things. Uh, a recent Supreme Court decision and our experience in applying this bylaw over the last 10 years. It was last updated in 2007, um, 10 years ago. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, so the Supreme Court decision, just really briefly, uh, was a decision by the court, it was unanimous, that the zoning bylaw in a town in Arizona violated the First Amendment because it had different um, restrictions on different types of signs. So it had, it was a bylaw based on the content of the signs and the restrictions were different based on content. That's exactly how the current Dover sign by law is structured. And so to be compliant with that Supreme Court decision, um, we're advised that our, our bylaw also should be updated to comply. And then since we're updating the bylaw to comply with that decision, the planning board has also proposed changes which will put into writing some of the considerations that we frequently see uh, when we have discussions about sign applications. Uh, and so to be consistent with the Supreme Court decision in Reed, uh, what we've done is we've changed the way the bylaw is currently structured, which um, lists different types of signs and different sizes, for example, for those types of signs. And we've gone to uniform sizes for temporary and permanent signs, rather than based on the content of those signs. Uh, that, that's in the residential district. There's no change at all to the uh, size. We already have a uniform size for signs in the commercial district. Next slide. And then with regard to the other considerations that the board uh, frequently considers but that aren't in writing um, to create better clarity in our conversations with applicants, we'd like to codify these. Um, they're fairly straightforward changes. Uh, the signs should be uh, in, of professional quality when they're commercial signs, no signs on or above roofs, uh, no day glow or luminescent colors, which are terms used in, in uh, similar bylaws in other towns. Uh, windows and glass doors uh, would have restrictions on the, si on the signs based on the size of, of the, the 
the amount of the, the glass that could be taken up by a sign, 20% of a window, 10% of the glass on a door. Uh, Freestanding signs, which are ground-mounted signs, would be limited to five feet in height um, from the ground, the same size as, as other signs in, in the districts. And then um, the bylaw would explicitly encourage signs that already exist but that don't meet the current um, bylaw requirements to be brought into compliance with the bylaw when those signs are updated or changed. We can't require that, but the current, the uh, new bylaw would encourage that, and so it would be a starting point for that discussion with applicants. Next slide. So again, voting, voting yes on this um, would bring us into compliance with Reed. It would create those updates to the bylaw um, for those other considerations, and uh, Planning Board uh, encourages that to help us manage signs as we continue to grow. I'm glad to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Sarah. Are there any questions or discussion? Any questions in the cafeteria? Okay, no questions or discussion. We'll move directly to the vote. This is a two-thirds vote. If you're in favor of this motion, please press one for yes. If you're opposed, please press two for no. You may vote now. Motion carries 358 to 16 by more than two thirds. We, we will now turn to Article 17, and I am going to have to recuse myself, and Mr. White will handle this article. Article 17, Cemetery Commission. Mr. Hammerley? Mr. Moderator, I move that the town authorize the Board of Selectmen to acquire by gift or donation any fees, easements, or other interests in a parcel of land abutting Highland Cemetery as shown as lot parcel A1 on a plan entitled, quote, Plan of Land in Dover, Mass, prepared by the Norfolk County Engineering Department, dated February 21, 2017, unquote, which is on file in the office of the town clerk and to dispose of any fees, easements, or other interests in the parcel of land shown as parcel A2 on the same plan for the purpose of clarifying the record title to certain land controlled by the Cemetery Commission as part of Highland Cemetery. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Kong. For purposes of discussion, we'll turn to Mr. Ramsey, the town administrator. Over the past year or so, the Cemetery Commission has been considering some potential aesthetic enhancements to the southern boundary of the Highland Cemetery. As part of its due diligence, it requested that the Norfolk County Engineering Department perform a survey to confirm and delineate the property boundary line. In the course of doing this work, an error was discovered in both the plan and deed on record, the Registry of Deeds. Turns out that the boundary line is not the green line shown at the bottom of the plan in front of you, but in fact, it is the red line in the middle of the plan. So the purpose of this article is to correct that error and clarify that it's the red line, which was the intended property line all along. Thank you, Mr. Ramsey. This would be a majority vote. Is there any discussion to be had on this particular article? Please come down. on in. Identify yourself. Bonnie Aikens, Greystone Road. Is there any money associated with this land swap taking? Mr. Ramsey? Th there is not. Th Why not? Because there was a conveyance, with, when the error was created back in the 80s, yeah. consideration was made at that time. Okay. Are there any other questions with regard to this article here in the main hall? Are there any questions from the cafeteria? There being no questions, this is a majority vote. We can now proceed to vote. If you wish to vote yes, please press 1. If you wish to vet, vote no, please press 2. You may now vote.
367 vote yes, 8 no, it passes. The article passes. I will now turn the uh, gavel back over to Mr. Repetti. Thank you, Mr. White. Only a lawyer could love this. <laughs> article 18, 46 Springdale Ave. Mrs. Gernard. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town authorize the Board of Selectmen to A, divide the property into two parcels, one primarily in the rear of the property, a conservation lot, and one containing the residence and outbuildings, the house lot, as shown on the plan on file in the office of the town clerk, and B, transfer the conservation lot, which is currently designated for general municipal use, from the Board of Selectmen to the Conservation Commission for conservation purposes, subject to the provisions of Article 97 of the Massachusetts Constitution. C, transfer the house lot from the general, oops. transfer the house lot from the general municipal use to the Board of Selectmen for purposes of disposition and D, sell, convey, release, or otherwise dispose of the house lot pursuant to Chapter 30B of the Massachusetts General Laws, and further, that such disposition be on such other terms and conditions as the Board of Selectmen deem appropriate, which may include the reservation of easements and restrictions over, along, or through the house lot. Thank you, Ms. Gurner. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. I'd like to now turn to Ms. McCann to explain. Thank you, I'm here. I'm down here. Oh, there you are, okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm, in the interest of time, we'll just go ahead and turn through a few of these, Bill, please. I think you'll all remember the history here. Almost three years ago, we as a town decided to acquire 46 Springdale, and it was a wonderful decision that the town made to acquire this land. When we came back, um, last year to talk about how we might handle the property, it was clear to us that you as a town wanted a better analysis about the property value and how we might use the land. Thank you very much. This is a picture that puts it into context. There is 46 Springdale with the town center to the right, Springdale running along with the red arrow and the center running right straight down. Thank you, Bill. Next. And again, please. So what we did was we pulled together a wonderful working group with a representative from each of the uh, significant boards and commissions in town. A representative joined the working group, and we looked carefully at this property and how we could um, hopefully regain some of the value of the property and also save the back land for conservation purposes. And so after many, many workings and many meetings, we engaged LandVest as our consultant to give us a market analysis and to help us evaluate the property. And we, we came up with three options. The recommendation from all of us was that we would like to suggest selling the buildings with the envelope of property around it. And the question was how large a piece of property should that be and then save the back lot. Again, we brought to the open forum on the 15th of February, we brought these three options, had a wonderful discussion and then took a straw vote. And interestingly enough, the audience in the straw vote supported our recommendation as well. Our recommendation was to sell the front parcel with two-thirds frontage with buildings and non-field acres, the paddock and the ring included. That would be approximately 4.5 acres. To retain the stream to the driveway for the public path and approximately 24 acres of fields and meadowlands and woods. The parking will be at, at Channing Pond. The estimated market value according to LandVest is $1.4 million. It does provide good public access for those of you who were able to join us for our walk uh, towards the end of the last month. We had a wonderful showing. It was a beautiful Sunday afternoon. And it does afford the town the opportunity to regain some of the financial expense. Thank you, Bill. 
Again, there is the full piece of property and you can see the small white square is one of the paddocks and so the red line is delineating that smaller parcel that will be sold off. You can see the stream and where that yellow line is is the public access coming right along and then there's the beautiful field at the back for conservation purposes and for passive recreation. Very similar to what is existing at Haven Street Field, also in Wildwoods. One more thank you. And thank you so much to Attorney Long. He gave us wonderful deed restrictions to place on the building lot. Um, it will always be uh, a single family. The premises may not be divided, and the premises may not be used for any public sale. So for any sale of goods, public sale of goods. So that way we can guarantee it stays for a, a single family. Again, thank you. The process to sell will be an RFP, a request for proposal. There are specific rules that apply to municipal property sales through the RFP process. Individuals will be able to bid, but there is no negotiation, unlike a normal house sale. Uh, the town may reject any and all bids if they are too low, so we'll never get stuck having to sell if, if we do not get enough of a bid. Uh, the property will be sold as is, and there will be no need for septic work to be done prior to the sale of the property. The concern is that if someone wanted to come in and buy the property and drop the buildings and build a different size house, then they might need a larger septic field. So it wouldn't make any sense for us to make that determination for them. So that's why there's no septic improvement. One more, thank you. So let's pass this article and see if we can get moving with that. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Ms. McCann. Uh, is there any discussion on this motion for 46 Springdale Avenue? Uh, yes, uh, lady, uh, Ms. McDonald. Please state your name and address. I'm Jean McDonald from 20 Main Street in Dover. First, I was rather surprised that this article was left to be the last article when half the people have left. This is a property that we have paid five and a half million dollars for, and we're looking to just recover a million and a half, and that, that other four million will go into conservation land. Um, I would have liked to have been able to see the conservation land. I was away the one time that we were offered an opportunity the land is posted as no trespassing, even though we have owned it for um, over a year. And, um, and it, uh, it's an opportunity for us to have, I, I would like to see the town continue to own the whole thing, all five and a half million dollars of it, and not sell off uh, the, all the frontage, essentially, except for a small pathway in. I think it would be a good idea to have this deferred till next year when we will have more opportunity to think about it. And um, one small thing that I did um, think of was if they sell off the house that's in front there, um, there is a parcel of land to the right of that that is about 36 acres of land. And what would happen if, the, if that land eventually came on the market and was bought by all, all of it bought by the same person, and, um, and then another 40B or something else could come before the town for what was essentially the same parcel. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. McDonald. If Any I, comments, Ms. Kenny? Right. I would like to just respond to the question. In fact, Bill, if you wouldn't mind, in my presentation, page 18 addresses the cost to the town if, in fact, we were to retain the entire piece of property. Uh, thanks to Dr. Clark very much for presenting that. Um, and I did, there were some appendices I had put together, but I didn't want to take the time. Thank you very much. Um, back at 18, it'll be, that's 17, one more, Bill. Thank you. As you can see, there are the figures. Would you like to? Thank you very much. 
Dr. Clark had done this wonderful slide. Uh, Jerry Clark, Board of Health. Uh, very quickly, uh, if you assume, uh, and there's an error here, but if you assume the current tax rate and therefore look toward a period of either, either 10 or 20 years, the foregone received taxes would either be 182700 or over a 20-year period, $365,400 that the town would not receive, would forego. Also, obviously, we would not receive the $1.4 million thereabouts. But furthermore, not selling that property would result in the failure to receive property tax rates on that property on the basis of it being a single family residence. So therefore, approximately another $18,000. When you put all of this together, over a period of some, well, excuse me, one other part here, and that is, uh, we are going to be forced into converting the current short-term notes, otherwise known as bans, into a 20 or 30 year bond. And as we've been delaying and interest rates have been going up, the fact is we're probably going to be looking at about a 4% bond, maybe less, but let's assume 4%. And therefore, there's yet another cost uh, in terms of the additional uh, monies that would have to be borrowed and therefore the interest paid on them. And lastly, assuming you keep the property but don't use the house, either you maintain it or you demolish it. And therefore, either way, you're looking at either maintaining it over a period of years or demolishing it, that adds another $100,000. So therefore, a 20-year period to keep the entire property, forgetting totally the $5.5 million that is sunk cost already, represents another $2.4 million. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Are there any further questions or comments? Any in the cafeteria? Oh, sorry, I didn't see you, sir. Oh, we one over here, too. Why don't you have me and say your name and My name address. is Rochelle Nesrella. I'm at 148 Walpole Street. I had a question for Ms. Tanning. Um, I understand in Section B that the motion would convert the conservation lot to general municipal, from general municipal use to passive recreation, I think you said. And I just wondered if other uses of that portion had been considered by the committee. I know there'd been some talk last year about a town pool, or maybe some other, um, not, I'm not talking about selling it, I'm talking about retaining by the town for the benefit right. of the community. If other options have been considered and what your thoughts were on those. Thank you very much. We did consider all of those options very carefully. We were also acting off the survey that was done with the town a year and a half ago by the study committee. And they found that while there was a small percentage of the town that was interested in, say, a larger recreational facility, that the vast majority were interested in conservation. And when we came back to town meeting a year ago, um, the concern was that we were leaving it in the term municipal use. And I think it, it did not sit well with the townspeople. The townspeople felt that that left open too many questions about, well, what does municipal use really mean? And so you had the sense from last year's town meeting that there was a preference for conservation. Conservation. Correct. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sorry, name and address. Uh, Michael Jaffe, 11 Schaffner Lane. Two quick questions. One, uh, who is to determine the minimum price or the minimum acceptable price? Uh, right. And second, uh, have, has the uh, committee gotten uh, opinions as to value other than a uh, non-local land vest? We felt very comfortable in the analysis that was done, and I'll tell you how we looked at this. We looked at the smaller parcel around the homes valued according to Landvest at 1.4. If we did not allow for public access, it would have been only another 1. Point, another 100,000 to 1.5. If, in fact, we sold off the entire piece of property with a conservation restriction on the back, in other words, but went to one owner, not only would we lose access to the back land, but then on top of it, um, it was only going to be valued at somewhere around 2.2 million. So it seemed to be the very best use to save the land, the great preponderance of land for conservation land, 
and to sell off the smaller of the two considered parcels. So I, I may not have clearly articulated uh, either of the questions. So the first question really goes to the determination of the minimum sale price. I, I believe there is a $1.4 million target. Um, how low do we go? I mean, can it sell for 500000 in the discretion of, well, what's the number? Well, I, I, I'm not sure at this exact moment what we would set it at. I think our goal would be 1.4. Then we're free to accept an offer that we choose to accept. In other words, they don't have to hit that mark. But we're free to turn down the offers. We're also free to accept. The one term I believe, if I'm correct, is that we would, if we took an offer, we would be obligated to take the highest offer. And then the second question goes to the uh, determination of value. Uh, were there any local realtors, brokers consulted uh, other than Landvest? No, but there would be at this particular point, we would do an RFP for the realtors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you. Ma'am, name and address? Heather Hodgson de Paula, 77 Main Street. Quick question, what year was the Hoyt property built? I believe 55. Uh, is that correct? Does anyone know? Okay, so um, I just think that I would hate to see another one of Dover treasures be torn down and lose that beautiful view of that farmland. Uh, and unfortunately, it is not protected by the commission. So my only, I think you've done a great job. I think protecting the conservation, I think it's great, but I'd love to see if we could save the look of the home. Could I just say that in selling the property, it's quite possible that someone will buy and retain that property just as is? That would be an ideal right. situation. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments in the auditorium or in the cafeteria? Okay, well, let's move to a vote. This is a two-thirds vote. So all in favor of the motion, please, please uh, press one for yes. If you're opposed, please press two for no. You may vote now. Calculator. There are 246 in favor, 135 opposed. Let us do the math. <laughs> Doesn't carry. The motion does not carry. Article 24. All right, sorry, Article 23, payment in lieu of taxes. Ms. Alders. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town, pursuant to the provisions of Chapter 59, Section 38H of the Massachusetts General Laws, authorize the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Assessors to enter into a payment in lieu of tax pilot agreement with the operator of the solar photovoltaic energy generating facility to be developed on a parcel of land located at 211 Powissett Street and shown on lots 002 and 004 on Assessors Map 19, substantially in the form as negotiated by the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Assessors as shown in the agreement on file in the town clerk's office. Thank you, Ms. Alders. So here a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Gurner. Any discussion? Ms. Hunter, would you like to make a few comments, Ms. Hunter? I, I would just like to make a few comments about this pilot program. As some of you may have noticed, we are, there is a solar array at the transfer station. This pilot, pro, this pilot agreement is, has been put in place with Blue Wave Capital. They are the owners of the solar array. Um, what, this, what this program will do will spread the taxes that they will pay to the town. Personal property taxes are typically front and loaded to assist them in the financing and, and also to help the town. The property taxes are going to be spread over the useful life of the solar array, which is 20 years. We, we will receive $28,000 per year from Blue Wave for that solar array. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Any further comments or questions? Anything in the cafeteria? Cafeteria. Nothing in the cafeteria, nothing here. Okay, let's move directly to the vote on the question. This is a majority vote. If you're in favor, please press one for yes. If you're opposed, please press two for no. You may vote now. The 
motion carries 315 to 34. Article 24, power purchase net metering credit or renewable energy agreement. Ms. Chirico. Mr. Moderator, I move that the, that the town authorize the Board of Selectmen to enter into power purchase net metering credit or renewable energy agreements for terms up to 20 years and upon such other terms and conditions as they deem to be in the best interest of the town. Thank you, Ms. Cherico. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hammerley. Any discussion on this motion? Yes, Ms. Eurotine Kent. Please st state your uh, name and address, please. Yeah, Justine Kent, your Tim, 23 Haven Street. Actually, I'm, this was a sleeper to me. Usually I'm up on things uh, at town meeting. But I'd like to know what the discussion was about this. I must admit, when I read this um, at home the other night, I wrote the word Enron. And the reason I wrote it is because... <laughs> I mean, we have a terrific uh, group of volunteers, and there, there's really seldom a mendacious human being on our Board of Selectmen or Warrant Committee. But I've also experienced in my years going before other towns um, situations where Boards of Selectmen are not so altruistic and make deals uh, with friends at disadvantages to the towns that they represent. So I am sort of against this. I, I really must admit, I'd love to hear your rationale for allowing the selectmen to commit up to, uh, for 20 years, uh, purchasing energy. I would frankly like the town meeting to retain the ability to uh, say yay or no to such a thing. So I would urge people to vote no. Thank you, Justine. Um, Ms. Hunter, would you like to respond to that? Yes, I would like to put this into some perspective. This again relates to the solar array that is is on Elm Poesset Street. As part as part of this agreement, it was a complex arrangement. The land belongs to Hale. The solar array was put in place, and and Blue Wave was retained by Hale Reservation. That array will be generating energy. Um, the town was in the position where we could enter into a, an arrangement with Blue Wave Capital to purchase power that's technically generated from the solar array. Uh, what this is is a financial arrangement whereby the town purchases credits for the power that is generated at Hale Reservation um, or, or at the solar array. In, in, in order for Blue Wave to, um, to be able to, to benefit from the SREC program that was in place, the town would have had to enter into an agreement with Blue Wave by December. We could not get a town meeting in place in time, and so we went to the region and asked the region if this would be something that they would like to do. It, based upon, um, our working with consultants, we believe we negotiated a very good deal, and the region actually worked with our consultants, and they purchased the power from the net metering arrangement. Since we had to turn that down, we many other towns already have a bylaw in place that allows selectmen to enter into arrangements for utilities only for 20 years. So we thought it would be a good idea to come to town meeting to see if the town would allow us to enter into such an arrangement. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Sir, uh, name and address? Uh, Michael Jaffe, 11 Schaffner Lane. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, just uh, I've, to respond to your concern, um, I have looked at the documentation. I've spent uh, about eight years uh, working in utility scale solar, and uh, this is is uh, quite customary and favorable for the town, in my opinion. Thank you, sir. Any further questions or comments? Oh, yeah. oh, sir, Mr. Fleming. Um, I don't know if some of you I have have been contacted by community workers to sign up. So what they didn't have was details. So I had them send me details. And there were some very interesting issues. No clarity about whether my costs 
would go up or down. But one really interesting one is if you sign up, you can't leave until they find a replacement. And when you leave, you pay $1,200. Now, magnify that to the volume that this town would be involved in, the major customer. So I think we need a lot more detail. You don't vote on this until you get real level of detail. And as you know, many of these operations fail across the country. They don't work. So let's hold off on a vote, no, until the selectmen can lay out for us the full details of this and the long-term implications. Thank you, Mr. Fleming. Any further comments or questions? How about in the cafeteria? Okay, oh, okay we have somebody else, yes. Ms. Hello, Rich? my name is Liddy Rich, 6 Meeting House Hill Road. I actually wrote the article that was in the Opinion Press, in the Dover Sherpin Press, about this installation. The people that were going around and signing people up were Solstice. They're a nonprofit trying to hook Blue Wave up with people who are interested. Just so you know, I've stayed in contact with them. There is an extensive waiting list for people who are willing to get on this program. So I don't think you're taking any risk in finding replacement people. And the estimated savings are in the range of 20 to 30 percent over your current utility bills. Those are facts that I'm aware of. And I think that um, some people are right in that not enough information was given out. But for all those reasons, I strongly encourage a vote in towards PLUS. And also, this helps Stover become a greener community. And we would qualify for more um, state grants as a result of doing all this. So there's a lot of good economic and good environmental reasons to vote this question. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Rich. Mr. Clark, name and address. Uh, Gerald Clark, Board of Health, Valley Road. Uh, I think there's a bit of misunderstanding here, and I th I'd like to point you to several specific words in this discussion, and that is uh, the ability to enter into net metering agreements. For those of you who have already installed solar panels, you know that means that whether or not you own the panels or you lease them, the result is that you are seeing a reduction in your metering because there's a essentially uh, negative flow. The benefit to the town can't be acquired because the town can't, if the town owns them, uh, it's a considerable expense, whereas if the town essentially install, has installed and then leases them, the result is the town has a net metering. Now the problem is you can't do this unless you're willing to go into a multi-year contract. This would authorize a multi-year contract. So it's, it's late and I go ahead, Ms. definitely Hunter. did not do a good job explaining this. So the, the net metering arranged agreement that was set in place that the town negotiated for the blue wave solar array the region has entered into that agreement in lieu of the town um, to purchase 55% of the power that is going to be generated from the solar array at Powesset Farm. The savings are approximately 20% off of their utility bill. The region will, will most, definitely, most definitely save somewhere around $20,000 over the next 20 years off of their utility bill in the form of a credit, just like you pointed out. The town is not asking to, for t town meeting authorization to enter into the net metering agreement. We are asking for the flexibility to be able to look at other net metering agreements that might be out there as a way for the town to potentially save money in connection with purchasing power. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, let's move to a vote on the question. In favor of this motion, please press one for yes. If you're opposed, please press two for no. You may vote now.
Motion carries 283 to 73. Article 25, easement pertaining to the town's closed and capped landfill. Mr. Cohn. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town authorize the Board of Selectmen to accept any easement or other interest upon such terms and conditions as the Board of Selectmen deem to be in the best interest of the town for purposes of maintaining the town's closed and capped landfill on portions of a parcel of land containing approximately 10.7 acres, more or less, located at 211 Poisset Street and shown as lots 002 and 004 on Assessor's Map 19. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Any discussion on this? Ms. Hunter. Will you allow me to make a brief sure. comment? I promise everyone this is the last time I'm going to talk about the solar array, but this was the third agreement in connection with that array, and it just so happens that the landfill belongs to Hale and does not belong to the town of Dover. And um, no one's quite sure how that happened, and so this <laughs> agreement allows us to have access to the landfill in order for us to, to continue to monitor it because the environmental liability is ours. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Any further discussion here or in the cafeteria? None. Okay, well, let's move to a vote on this motion. All in favor, please press one for yes. Opposed, please press two for no. You may vote now. Motion carries 336 to 19. Yes. Okay, a motion has been made for reconsideration. Um, if the motion's made within a half, well, first let me ask, does anybody second this motion? Okay, uh, sir? 21 Walpole Street. Okay, Mr. Long has seconded the motion. Um, a motion for reconsideration. If the motion is made within a half hour of the main motion having been approved, it is a majority vote for reconsideration. If it's made more than a half hour after the main motion has been voted on, it's a two-thirds vote. So let me check with town clerk to determine when we had the vote on this motion. Okay, the, the, the vote was taken more than a half hour ago, so this is going to be um, a two-thirds vote to reconsider. We're going to first vote on the motion for reconsideration. That will be a two-thirds vote, and then we'll move back to a discussion of the main motion. Yes? It was Article 18, wasn't it? Well, town clerk, let me ask town clerk again. Time was 10.05. So which was it? Okay, it was 11.05. Okay, thank you, Felicia. Um, so it is made within a half hour, so this is a majority vote. This may be discussed. <laughs> this may be discussed uh, if there are any questions or comments. Mr. Clark? No, the, excuse me. A motion for reconsideration is a majority vote. Then... This is on Springdale. Springdale was a two-thirds. Springdale, the main motion is a two-thirds vote, but a motion for reconsideration is a majority vote if it is made within 30 minutes of the vote on the main motion. Felicia Hoffman, a town clerk, has just certified that this motion was made within 30 minutes. Therefore, we will now, and it has been seconded, we will now consider 
the motion for reconsideration. Discussion is allowed, and after the discussion is complete, we will move to the vote, and that will be a majority vote. Then, if the motion for reconsideration passes, we will go back to consider Springdale once again. So now the discussion should pertain to the motion for reconsideration. Mr. Long. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, perhaps I should have spoken earlier on this. Uh, I don't think people realize exactly what the previous vote did. It meant we're stuck with this property for another year and the cost of maintaining it. Now, we had a very extensive discussion in these various committee meetings as to what, what should be done with the property. Some people said we should uh, hang on to the whole property and tear down the house. Other people think that, well, we should rent out the house so we should figure out some use for it. And that clearly is not a very financially feasible, sensible thing for the town to be doing. We're not in the real, real estate rental business. Uh, my own view it had initially been that we should sell the entire property with a conservation restriction on the back of it. Well, a majority of the people who were involved in this felt that, well, no, that's not what we should do. We should, we should hang on to it. So the point is, if we don't do what is proposed in uh, Article 18 and do nothing, we're stuck with this for another year, and we've got to try and figure out what to do with that. Uh, we tried to come up with what was the majority view of how to handle this. I think we've come up with a reasonable compromise of the various different viewpoints. If we reject this, then we're going to have to deal with this a year from now. It's, it's really time to make this decision. As far as the question about what the valuation was being done and whether we should have another uh, broker involved, uh, the rent, Landvest people, particularly Jay Boyle, Jay Boyle's been at this business for 30 years in this area. I mean, he was as well qualified as a person as we were going to find to make an evaluation of what the finances are here. So let's reconsider this. Let's vote for it by two-thirds majority and get this off, off the agenda here and off the town's uh, cost, uh, off the town uh, expenses that the town has to endure uh, to hold on to this for another year. Thank, thank you, Mr. Long. Uh, Mr. Clark? Uh, name and address, please, sir. Gerald yeah. Clark, Board of Health, Valley Road. I, it's unfortunate. Uh, we as a committee apparently in the presentation failed to m make one very important legal point here. It is a liability to the town. It is a residence that is not being continuously occupied as a residence. Therefore, given that fact, we are going to have to demonstrate to the insurance company that case. We've been holding off on the hope that it would be sold there's no question that it will now be viewed as an unoccupied property. It will be a liability and considerable insurance cost over and above the carrying cost of the property. Uh, I don't know if you've been there. If you haven't, let me just tell you, it is not a piece of property that is under constant police view. It's unoccupied. If something happens, we, we're going to have to face additional costs. I'm not sure I understand why we would not go forward on this, but by not going forward on it, we've put an additional burden on the town. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Is there any further discussion? Okay, this is the motion for reconsideration. This is a majority vote. If you're in favor of the motion for reconsideration, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no. You may vote now. The motion, the motion for reconsideration passes 202 to 161. We now return to the main motion, Article 18, which is a two-thirds vote. Is there any discussion on the main motion before we move to a two-thirds vote? Yes, Ms. Lisbon, please, uh, please state your name and address, Carol. Carol Lisbon, 2 Cross Street. 
this is uh, three years now since we've bought this property. Uh, I was a member of this latest committee as well. I think one of the points we should make is that we were all pleasantly surprised actually to see that the land vest evaluation of the property lot was almost identical to the same evaluation that we had done when we came before you in uh, September of 2014 to, to buy the property. So we felt that when in a three year period with basically the same cost by uh, different evaluators, that this was a very good indication that that was just about the price we were gonna get. And if you remember back to the uh, September 2014, the town overwhelmingly supported buying this property with the understanding that they would probably get back about a million point four, a million point five when the house lot was sold. That was the original plan. So we're now at a point where every year we get a different group of folks coming into town meeting, reinventing the thought process, and all it's doing is costing us hundreds of thousands of dollars, and to Jerry's point, probably over two million dollars over the next 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lisbon. Next, uh, please state your name and address. Tara Nolan, Cranberry Lane. I'm also on open space. And I was on the second committee, I guess, that looked at this. Um, with regard to the market, you know, we can all sit here and speculate whether we've got the right estimate, but the market is the market. So I think when we put it on the market, we'll find out what the market value is. I'm not sure waiting a year is gonna change that or at least change that by enough that offsets the extra carrying cost for a year. Um, it's a great piece of property. I think having the conservation in the back is fantastic. Having access from both sides, uh, I think, is sensible. We tried to get together people from every committee, and there had been a <clears throat> pretty wide diversity of opinion among the committees and among townspeople last year, and we were pretty pleased that the group that was reassembled was able to get virtually to a majority. I think uh, Warrant Committee had to abstain. But, um, you know, we put a lot of thought and effort into it. I'm not sure how much more uh, thinking we're gonna get in another year. Okay. I'm playing Battleship here. All right, we're all really tired. Kristen Dennison, 36 Springdale Avenue. That's my neighborhood. It torques me off every time I drive by there and see a no trespassing sign. We paid $5 million for this property. This property belongs to us. Let's sell the house. Let's get the path going. Let's be able to use that property. I. Let's go. Thank you. <laughs> Sir. Boynton Glidden, 55 Pine Street. Uh, I worked in the Dover Medical Professional Building abutting this property for 40 years. I've lived in the town and my family has for my, my whole life. Uh, that's a beautiful piece of property. The brook that originates behind Pine Street, behind my house, eventually goes through the spring on that property. It's got one of the few remaining streams of native brook trout. The field is very open, it's beautiful, has field nesting birds. Uh, I don't know whether they're state endangered, but certainly some of the migratory birds are in state endangered. So I think we've, we've done a tremendous amount of work. My hats are off to all the committee. And all we need to do is change eight votes. Come on, let's get with it. Let's do what we want to do. I vote we reconsider and vote yes. Okay, any further new comments or new arguments? None in the gymnasium, uh, none in the cafeteria also, so let's move to a vote on the question. Again, this is a two-thirds vote. If you're in favor of selling the home and retaining the back lot, you will press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no. You may vote now. Motion carries 284 to 77. That is more than two thirds, so the motion passes. Article 26, Reserve Fund. Ms. Gernard. Mr. Moderator, I move that the sum of $250,000 be appropriated for a reserve fund for fiscal year 2018 
to provide for extraordinary or unforeseen expenditures pursuant to Chapter 40, Section 6 of the Massachusetts General Laws, and that to meet this appropriation, $150,000 be raised and $100,000 be transferred from the overlay surplus. I hear a second. Ms. Cherico? Uh, second. Thank you, Ms. Cherico. Uh, any discussion on this motion with respect to the reserve fund? Any discussion in the cafeteria? Okay, no discussion. Uh, this is a majority vote. Let's move to a vote in favor. Press one for yes or oppose. Press two for no. You may vote now. Motion carries 299 to 19. Article 27, Warren Committee article. Ms. Gilbody. Mr. Moderator, I move that the sum of $918.74 be transferred from pre-cash for the purposes of paying Aqua Berries Incorporated, $918.74. Do I hear a second? Second. Mr. Stewart has seconded, seconded Ms. Gilbody's motion. This requires an 80% vote. Four-fifths vote by statute. That's why we have the clickers, uh, along with the other votes, some of the others we've had tonight. Is there any discussion here or in the cafeteria? No discussion. Let's move directly to a vote. All in favor of this vote, uh, press one for yes. Opposed, press two for no. You may vote now. Three hundred thirty-two fifteen. Motion carries. Thank you. <laughs> okay, on to Article Twenty-Eight, um, Supplemental Appropriations. Mr. Hamley. Mr. Moderator, I okay. move that this article be dismissed. Let me go back to Article Twenty-Seven and state the obvious for the record: the motion carried by more than four fifths. Thank you. Okay, Article Twenty-Eight. There's been a motion to dismiss Article Twenty-Eight by Mr. Hamley. Do we have a second, Mr. Cohn? Second. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Any discussion on this matter? Any in the cafeteria? Hearing none, let's move directly to a vote. All in favor of dismissal, press one for yes. Opposed, press two for no. You may vote now. Motion carries 330 to 9. Article 29, free cash. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town transfer from free cash the sum of $2,030,419.75 mm -hmm. exactly to meet appropriations for fiscal year 2018 and that the Board of Assessors be authorized to use the same amount to reduce the tax rate for fiscal year 2018. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Do I hear a second? Second. Ms. Kenny has seconded. Is there any discussion on this motion? Ms. Lisbon. Hello. I'm sorry, folks. Carol Lisbon, 2 Cross Street. Um, the issue of using free cash, as Mr. Stewart mentioned many hours ago, uh, is a complex one and both uh, an objective one, but there's also a quite a philosophical subjectivity to the issue of how the town of Dover continues to uh, finance its, its needs and future needs. By uh, making this motion now to all of a sudden uh, use more free cash than is normal, there has been absolutely no education um, of any of us and discussion about the town's future liabilities and how we might want to use some of that, quote, extra free cash to do things like fund OPEB liabilities at the region, which is zero funded, or um, in the town of Dover, which is somewhat funded, 
um, and other capital expenses that we might have over the next decade or so. So I, I'm not, I'm not de definitively opposed to using more free cash. I just feel that at this point in time, it's been uh, thrown at us without any perspective and uh, overall discussion. Thank you. Mrs. Stewart? We're going to pick off, pick up uh, where we left off a little bit on the free cash discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So just to remind everybody, and we'll make this as quickly as quick as possible, but the basic amount of free cash that we would use that we have used for the last 10 years to plug the budget gap um, um, is determined by the gap between revenues and expenditures. And this year, that is a million six hundred thirteen thousand dollars six hundred thirteen thousand dollars thirteen uh, next slide and as we saw before that this is the percentage of the budget gap um, the percentage of the expenses that we use um, for uh, free cash generally next um, as we said we have reviewed extensively and I think to, I don't want to mischaracterize it. We've been we've done extensive analysis this year as well as in previous years to look at the level of free cash to compare ourselves to other towns and to look at future needs. Next slide. Um, as we said before, we've experienced a significant increase in free cash, and we went through this before. Next, I'll get to this new stuff in very soon. Um, again, it's at a, a level that we think it's um, above the prudent necessity. Next. 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 Uh, next. We are uh, proposing to use an additional $1.3 million of free cash to reduce the property tax rate. Um, our analysis is that it will leave uh, a, a sum of $5.2 million of uncommitted free cash um, going in. Um, that is 13.4% of the forecasted fiscal year 18 expenses. And then if you include the stabilization fund that we have that has more than $860,000 in it, that would be 15.7% of expenses. In addition, at the end of this fiscal year, we anticipate some amount of turnbacks that are not funds that are not spent by the town departments, as well as some uh, additional um, SPED reimbursement from Circuit Breaker. Those amounts are undetermined yet. Uh, they could, in one year, they could be very small, but we've had consistent amounts over previous years that gives us comfort that it will not be small. But even if it is, we should be okay. Next slide. Um, and as we've said, the recommendation does not rely on an assumption that free cash will continue to grow as it has at a significant pace above what is required. Next. This is the slide um, that we've seen before, but it shows the, the larger amount of free cash. Next. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on what is free cash, but it's essentially the town's reserves that have built up over time. Next. Um, skip. Next. Um, what happened this past year? The free cash was certified in July of 2015 at 5.9 million. Next. Uh, it was in July of 2016, 8.2 million. And that was an increase of 2.3 million, approximately, or 38%. Next. The way that evolved was the balance. Next. We used some amount at last year's town meeting of 888,234,000. Uh, we had turnbacks, um, which were larger last year than normal. Um, there was about 400,000, a little more than 400,000 that came from the regional schools, which was a one-time thing because their free cash, which is in, called the excess and deficiency account, was over what the state wanted them to have and needed to turn them back. So they turned funds back to us and to Sherborne, and that's, we view that as a one-time thing. That was 453,000. Next. Um, we um, used uh, for snow and ice, um, it was, uh, our snow and ice budget went over. 
and um, we received uh, the free cash balance increased because of some other miscellaneous items next. And then additionally, um, it also went up because of an excess of um, revenues over expenditures by a million dollars next. And that's how we arrived at the larger balance. Uh, most of those things were unanticipated during the time. Next. Um, this slide shows the certified free cash balance each year from 94 to 17. And you can see it progressively increasing to over 8 million. Next. Uh, this includes the stabilization fund. So you're, you're in the $9 million range with the stabilization fund. Next. Uh, this is the budget. The budgets are also increase, increasing um, substantially. Next. Uh, the percentage of free cash as a percentage of the budget has been increasing. So we've been, we've been accumulating more and more free cash um, as a percentage of our budget than in the past. Next. We use free cash. So as I said, we use a certain amount of free cash um, to plug the gap in the budget. But the amount we've been using has been declining over time. And it's um, in the, uh, it's in the recent years, it's been in the 10 to 20% range. Next. And that's left, left more unused free cash that we haven't used. Next. Um, we have talked about a target level of free cash being between 10 and 15 percent of the total expenditures. And this is where we are. That line is 15 percent. That's the upper boundary that I said that we would feel most comfortable with. That line shows that we are greater than that. Next. Um, if we allocate the 1.3 million additional, we, it brings us down to just a little bit below the line, but with the stabilization fund, we'll be above that line. Plus, we'll also receive anticipated uh, additions to um, free cash at the end of the fiscal year. So we feel that this is a prudent thing. We've done a substantial analysis. Um, we can't guarantee, nobody knows how things are going to evolve or turn out, but we feel that it makes sense uh, given the situation. Next. Um, this is just another informational slide. Next. Um, quickly run through this bill. Um, we obviously look at all these items uh, when we evaluate free cash. Next. Um, one other factor that we've looked at that I just wanted to include because we are short for time, but is the amount of debt that Dover has outstanding. Yes, there are OPEB liabilities. Hold it. Wait. Now let, let Mr. St let Mr. Uh, Stewart finish, and then we will move to a consideration of motion. We have one more slide. Um, but yes, there are o OPEB liabilities. Um, the town's OPEB liabilities are largely covered. We have there's it's still being funded, but we were at we asked if we should fund additional amounts, and we were told that didn't make sense. The region has not addressed their OPEB liabilities yet. We are meeting with Sherborne and the region this summer to discuss how they're going to address the OPEB liabilities and, and, and um, we're making progress on that. We feel that even with these things, these uh, obligations that we have outstanding out in front of us, that this would be a prudent thing to do. And this slide just simply shows you that our debt, other than the Springdale debt that we will probably have once we um, sell part of the property and convert the rest of the short-term loans to long-term, our, um, our, our other debt has been declining to near zero and will be in the zero range in, 20, in 2023. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, there, somebody was um, yelling a motion from the floor. You have to be recognized before you can make a motion. We have two people who have been waiting patiently in line. Let's hear them, extend them courtesy to hear what they have to say. And then I will entertain a formal motion to move the question. Ms. Akins. Okay. Bonnie Akins, Greystone Road. My first question is, would you restate, please, the amount? I believe it, the amount that you stated was not exactly the 2.9 amount. Would you, please? The amount of what? The total transfer for free cash. Right. 
in the motion? The, the total transfer for free cash in the motion was two million thirty thousand four hundred nineteen dollars, and the reason that doesn't turn out to be the number is because the number that I've quoted being the additional amount is that because we've already voted at uh, at this meeting to take other for, for certain things to use free cash for those items. So for instance, we only did it in one. We used free cash for chickerings, no, air conditioning, 600, it, that was part of the motion, $675,000. And secondly, for the regional capital items, that's part of the motion and traditionally has been part of the motion was it since. I, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear it during town meeting. I just want to be sure. It was in the, it was in the, um, it was in the. I know uh, in the regional high school it was there. It, it was in our books, it and I heard it, and we checked it off. So okay. I, 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 you can check the tape on that one. Okay, okay. So the total to be transferred, including the prior special articles, is 2.9. 2. Point, no, uh, right, exactly, yes. Okay. Yes, so, yes, exactly. Yes. So that is a good amount of money uh, because, as you saw, from 2000, July of 2015 to July of 2016, free cash increased by over $2 million. And our total town sp expenditures for all things for FY17 was approximately $39 million. $8 million is too much. That is money that you and I have already paid that has been turned back because of prudent expending by a circuit breaker from the state. And it, the tax rate is going too high. And I have a lot to do with assessing your properties fairly and equitably. I've been here long enough to know when free cash was zero. I've also been here long enough to know that Chickering has only a couple years left on its bonding. We have a few years left on the region and the high school. The highway garage is paid for. The police station is paid for. <coughs> the fire department is paid for. And we need, if you think something big needs to be paid for, coming up in the next few years, then borrow for it and pay for it while you're using it. I recommend this highly that we pass this free cash article. Thank you, Ms. Akins. Uh, Mr. Jeffries, could you state your name and address, please? Mr. Moderator, John Jeffries, Meeting House Hill Road for the Selectmen. Mr. Moderator, the Board of Selectmen join the Warrant Committee in acknowledging and the Board of Selectmen extends our thanks to each of the boards and the department leadership for the sound management which makes this possible. This is an envious financial position. Bill, I'm not going to use slides, so we'll just make this really brief. The Board of Selectmen disagree with the strategy proposed. The Selectmen have met with the Warrant, encouraged Warrant to preserve the ability to use free cash as we've demonstrated this evening. We've used free cash in several articles this evening. The selectmen believe a set aside is a prudent strategy versus a turn back. Utilizing a set aside is going to allow for much greater flexibility. It is still a prudent, possible, and quite frankly, a much more flexible way of managing our cash flow. We have a number of very large liabilities that will need to be funded. Ms. Lisbon mentioned pensions, health insurance, compensation, special education. We've mentioned at length 46 Springdale, and we have also taken consideration Carroll School. The Board of Selectmen suggest we use the ability, we maintain the ability to be flexible, and we thank you for this consideration. Now there was a, mo thank you, sir. There was a motion to move the question that was shouted from the floor. Would the gentleman who shouted that like to, to come down and make the motion, sir? Sorry, Mr. Crowley, we, I said I was going to cede the floor to him next. Green, 54 Haven, a motion to move the vote, please. Right. Motion has been made to move the question. Do I hear a second? Somebody please bring a microphone down to the gentleman. Raise your hand. Oh, Mr. Springer, come to the mic. Thank you. Name and address. Uh, Bob 
Bob, Spr uh, Bob Springett, 28 Francis Street. Okay, so the motion has been made to move the question and it has been seconded. Uh, this is a non-debatable motion. If you're in favor, please press one for yes. Opposed, please press no for no. We may vote now. Motion carries 311 to 20. We now will move to a vote on the motion for free cash. This is a majority vote. All in favor, you may press one for yes. You may press two for no in just a second before we start the formal voting process. You may vote now. Motion carries 279 to 59. On to Article 30, Ms. Canney, Stabilization Fund. Mr. Moderator, Mr. Moderator, I move that this article be dismissed. So I hear a second. Second. Motion has been made to uh, dismiss Article 30. Is there any discussion on this article here or in the cafeteria? No. Okay, I think we're getting close. Let's do a voice vote rather than do a... Uh, do a, um, a clicker vote. All in favor of dismissing this article, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously in the auditorium. How about the cafeteria? Motion carries unanimously in the cafeteria. Ms. Canny. Mr. Moderator, I move that this meeting be dissolved. Do, do I hear a second? Second. Ms. Alders has second a motion. All in favor to dismiss this, to dissolve this motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Don't forget to turn your clickers back in. Thank you.